All right, welcome to Tuesday Night Tour Study! Woo! All the smiling faces, it's good to be home. Thank you for the warm reception, and thank you for everyone that listened to Rabbi and decided to blow up the phones on yesterday. That was just amazing. You guys were listening. I know it for a fact. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm teasing and telling the truth at the same time. It was crazy yesterday, but I appreciate all the love and support, and I'm definitely glad to be home and back at it because Rabbi Tom missed me so much. He did miss me. He told me. <laughs> well, anyway... For all of you that don't know, you're just turning, uh, tuning in. This is our Tuesday night tour study. We do this every Tuesday at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. And we're here as a part of our service uh, and part of our mission to help serve the body, working together to serve the body. We do it for those of you who are out there can participate. This is an interactive service where you're able to chat in the live stream here on YouTube, uh, ask questions and Maybe they'll get answered, maybe they won't, we'll see. But if you type them in, we'll do our best to answer it. Usually, the reason I say that, because usually Rabbi, when he comes out to do the Midrash, he covers just about everything you could possibly think of. And then some extra. <laughs> and then some extra. So we have an amazing Rabbi who's been doing this a very long time. Amen, yeah. Amen. I'm sure that's why all of us are here. Because we found our anointed and appointed, and he is truly... Uh, amazing and, and gifted by y'all to do what he does. So how it works is we'll go through the Torah portion. We'll go through the readings. Each reader will come up. I'll do a blessing over them, uh, say a blessing over them, and then uh, they'll do their portion that they're reading. Um, and then after we finish reading all of the Torah portions, we'll do another prayer over all the readers. Then we'll have a time, well, we'll start with a time of prayer and praise. And so if you're online and you've been here before, this is an opportunity now where you can start typing them in while I tell you what else is going to happen throughout the service. So if you have a prayer or praise that you want to share, uh, you can type it in online. If you're here, you can start lining up. So we do pray and praise first so we can hear what's been going on since Shabbat. And then after that, we'll go through uh, the Torah portion, which tonight is Shoftim. Shof team, and that is Judges, means Judges. We're going to read through that book, uh, that Torah portion tonight. It's nine readings. Uh, after that, we'll do a announcements. And after announcements, Rabbi will come out and do the Midrash and answer any questions. If there are any, by the time he finishes his teaching us uh, what we need to know about this Torah portion. So what do you need to do? You need to be looking at this portion and finding uh, Anything that can be applied to your life. How can you use this Torah portion, this reading, to help you better walk out uh, your Torah pursuance? I mean, so it's really exciting. There's a lot you can get out. One thing that, that helps me, uh, might be able to help some of you, is when Rabbi teaches, I don't take notes. I know some people like to take notes, and I'm not discouraging it. I just don't take notes. And I know sometimes people look at me because I'm the elder and wonder why he's not taking notes because I go back and look at it later, and then I take notes because I can pause it and stop it. Because it always happens for me that every time I take out a pen and paper to write a note, he goes over something and I miss it. So I gotta go back and listen to it anyway. So I figured I'll just listen to it and get it while he's giving it, and if I need to go back and take notes, then I'll go back. So that might be helpful for some people. I know some people, uh, you know, they can remember it and listen and do you can multitask in the moment. Hey, Reverend. Um and I just can't. So if that helps you, that's for you. You can have it. All right. So once again, if you're just joining us, we're going to read through the Torah portion. We're going to then have some announcements. And this is after prayer and praise, which we're about to do. And then uh, Rabbi will come out to do the Midrash and answer any questions that may be lingering. All right. So we're going to start here locally with Mr. Michael Condon. Shalom. Shalom. So Ashley's kind of got a little bit of thing going on, and she just wants some prayers for her to be able to clean, cleave, and hold fast. Amen. Um, because it's, it can be disturbing to the shalom if one does not watch over themselves. Um, also, I wanted to give a praise that um, our dog, Sandy, is doing a little bit better. Um, so she's, she's able to move around better than she was Amen. before. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's awesome. Rabbi Tom. All right. Rabbi Tom. Thanks. 
Thank you, Order and Shalom. Shalom. Um, first of all, a gentleman from Ohio, um, Scott Anderson, called and requested prayers for his nephew, Robbie LaRoche, who has uh, his appendix burst and he's in the hospital. Amen. And so uh, he, he's, uh, Scott is uh, his only form of transportation, so he's taking care of his nephew. And also, I would like prayers for my grandson-in-law, uh, Ayub Adachur. Uh He had a back surgery, and he has staples in his back, and he's getting, getting them out Thursday, and he'll find out if the operation was a success. And we hope and pray it is, because he wants to go back to work and support his family. Amen. And uh, so that's, that's all I have. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Rabbi Tom. Uh, live stream, do you have anything? There's many unspoken. And from Alaric, please pray for my mother's power to come back on. We had bad storms last night. From biblical, not political. Praise Abba for you, Elder Billy, Rabbi Bergson, and Rabbi Tom. And a huge praise for Marlene. Thank you for being there for us. Amen. From James Jolly, please pray for ongoing health issues for me, also for Jerusalem and the mess in the Middle East. Mm. From Evangeline Agalasso, praise Yah for this day. Some unspoken prayers, please. Thank you. From Shirley Akpelu, praise report, comfort, and shalom for a friend encouraged by his word. From Shelley Bell Creations, praise Yah that my daughter is coming to spend time with me tomorrow. It's been over a year. Prayers that she'll see my light shine and be willing to get help with her drug addiction. Amen. From Walk Softly Upon the Earth, prayer for my husband's job interview tomorrow. He's been a full year without work since the time of our move, so praise for a happy year and that my husband gets this job. Amen. Amen. From w William R., prayer request for healing and comfort for our daughter-in-law. She's in the hospital with a painful cyst on her ovary. From Breath of Life, asking for prayer for my daughter and aunt who are COVID positive and not feeling well. Covering, for, covering prayer for protection for my grandchildren and parents, too, who are around them. Thank you. From Michael and Ashley Condon, praise Yah. I'm learning that Yah is always causing and allowing to keep remembering that, I still, that I'm still alive and I need to remember to stay in Him. I think Deuteronomy 8.2 is a life mission. From Mark Usri, prayer for me, please. Dealing with depression, just can't seem to get a issue resolved and it's mentally wearing on me. And from Pamela Shuford, prayers for my husband. And I believe that is all from the live stream. And I have a couple praises. Uh, recently in my job, I have received one of the biggest contracts for what I do that I've ever received in my life. And I think that I can attribute it to two things, one of which being I went and I got counseling. And the first time I went, I like, kind of listened, like if I'm going to be completely honest, I like kind of listened and then kind of didn't. And then a couple weeks later, I ended up back into counseling. And at that point, I fully listened. And, and then as a result, just a couple, like week or two later, I have, I, I won't get into the details of it, but it's just the biggest contract that I've ever received. And as well as the work that I've been doing to internally always make sure that I'm living in a state that would be pleasing to him because I know that he calls me to live in a state of joy regardless of the things that I'm going through. And that's something that is a constant struggle for me, but it's something that I'm slowly getting better and better and better at the more that I work and the more that I put my mind towards developing on that inner man. And I'm just incredibly thankful that I can see the fruit and the results and just the absolute abundance that he's pouring out in my life as I constantly just work towards becoming more like him and less like me. And so just all praises to him because I know that I wouldn't be where I am without him. And then 
Also a praise that somebody from my stream came by and told me that they were that they ended up watching the Shabbat live stream service on Saturday and that they really enjoyed it. <laughs> and so hopefully they'll listen in a few more times and keep on listening the same way that I did. Ah, man, that is tremendous. Awesome praise. I tell you one thing that's really awesome for me is I get to sit in on the counselings and sometimes participate in the conversation. And so uh, to see the growth that Grayson has made since the first time I sat in on counseling, and even if you, when he used to sit in counseling with us, um, the tremendous growth that he's gone through and still pursuing above anything else, I can say that he's seeking first the kingdom. When you seek first the kingdom, he said, all these things I'll add to you. And I know in spite of him wanting to be here uh, as much as he can, We've always encouraged him to keep pushing and keep doing what he's doing, and Abba will continue to open the doors, and he has, and he's still still pushing and still doing it, even with this huge praise. So I'm very proud of you. Just wanted you to know that, Grayson. Awesome. That is awesome. All right, Miss Janet. I already said it. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's three other people, like <laughs> the Stevenson's twins. I think they're turning 15 today. Wow. And okay. I think Gabe, Gabe Carmona is Gabe. also wow. whatever num year now he is. I don't know. Goodness Hi, gracious. Gabe. And then uh, obviously my husband. And yeah. I wanted to praise Abba because my husband is really becoming the man of God thanks to Rabbi's counseling. Oh, really awesome. man. Thank you. Oh, man. Happy birthday, everybody. That's awesome. My wife reminded me after, after uh, I guess it was Shabbat, she said, you didn't say happy birthday to me. I was like, well, I didn't want to say it before your birthday. So I also want to say add happy birthday to my wife. Her birthday was Tuesday. So happy birthday to you as well, my love. Yeah, that's awesome. All these birthdays. That's awesome. All right. If we don't have any more prayer praise, we get one of the, we do? Okay. No? Okay. All right. If we don't have anything else, any more prayer and praise, we're going to ask one of the gentlemen to raise their hand. And All right, Kendall, I saw you first. I should have got Mr. Harold. <laughs> I'm going to get you one week. Okay. Abba, Father, creator of the heavens and the earth, Father, we just thank you and praise you for um, letting us meet together today to uh, study your Torah we ask that you be with uh, Elder and Rabbi as, um, as they um, give us information from the scriptures. Um, we also ask that we just lift up these prayers and praises to you. We thank you for all the praises and the answered blessings. And uh, we just ask for continued uh, answers on the uh, prayer request, Father. We love you, and we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In the name above all names, Messiah Yeshua, we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. Well, uh, once again, just as we fill up, we got nine readings. I believe it's six chairs out, so we fill them up one, one and a half times. If you can start filling those up, I'll explain to our viewers what we're going to do if they just joined us. So we're going to read through the, Deut um, the Torah portion, Shof Team, which means judges. It's nine readings. We're going to read through that Torah portion. After that, we're going to have some announcements, and after announcements, Rabbi will come up and do the Midrash. Uh, answer any questions that may be lingering. I doubt if there are any. He's, he goes through it very thoroughly. Um, if you're online, we have our Shamish team on there as well as Grayson and, and Paul. We just ask that you continue to be respectful. I know that you will. This is our tour portion study service. So this is what we do, and we invite you guys to be a part of it and to interact with us as we do it. For those out there that don't have a place to go and would like to study with us, also, too, you'll hear during the announcements, if you have any comments or questions, uh, you can feel free to visit our website at m2i.org, and we have questions there, and we also have emails and phone numbers. Best way to do it is call us during the week. As you heard, Marlene does an amazing job. She's our receptionist. She does an amazing job with what she does. And when she walks away, we have amazing Rabbi Tom that also helps with the phone calls and all those. A lot of people get to talk to him. Yeah, he's awesome with it. <laughs> and, and yesterday I got the joy of 
answering the phones, and I haven't done it in a very long time. I got a joy of answering the phones, and I was so pleased, and I know many of you know because you called in, I was so pleased to hear the love and the respect and the appreciation for, for me and the welcome backs, but really for them to be able to tell me to my ear, so to speak, uh, the appreciation they have for the ministry and all that I was doing through us. And so that was, that was great to hear, especially on my first day back, so praise you out for that. Um, and all those prayer and praises that have come in since Shabbat, and I uh, really appreciate that too, so I didn't want to forget that. All right, so what's going to happen is the reader's going to come up. I'm going to do a blessing over them. They're going to read the portion, and after we get done, Rabbi Tom is first, yes. Um, and after we get done, uh, I'll do a blessing over everybody. Once again, we'll do announcements, and after announcements, Rabbi Steve will come out and do the Midrash. And any questions and answers that are left. All right, so let's first have Rabbi Tom to come up. Rabbi Tom is going to do our first reading in Deuteronomy 16, 18 to 17, 7. So you can follow along. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may bless Rabbi Tom, who's come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of his hands. Amen. Appoint judges and officers within all your gates, which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you, according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous right ruling. Do not distort right ruling. Do not show partiality nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Follow righteousness, righteousness alone, so that you live and inherit the land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. Do not plant for yourself any tree as an Asherah, near the slaughter place of Yahweh your Elohim that you make for yourself. And do not set up a pillar which Yahweh your Elohim hates. Do not slaughter to Yahweh your Elohim a bull or a sheep which has any blemish or any evil matter, for that is an abomination to Yahweh your Elohim. When there is found in your midst, in any of your cities which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you, a man or a woman who does what is evil in the sight of Yahweh your Elohim in transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other mighty ones and bowed down to them or the sun or the moon or to any of the hosts of the heavens which I have not commanded and it has been made known to you and you have heard and have searched diligently, then see if true the matter is confirmed that such an abomination has been done in Israel, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil matter, and you shall stone to death that man or woman with stones. At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is to die be put to death. He is not put to death by the mouth of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and the hand of all the people last. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Tom. Next up, we have Michael. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Michael, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of his hands. Amen. All right, you're going to take us chap, uh, yeah, chapter 17, verses 8 to the end of the chapter. When any matter arises which is too hard for you to judge between blood and blood, between plea and plea, or between stroke and stroke, matters of strife within your gates, then you shall rise and go up to the place which Yahweh your Elohim chooses, and shall come to the priests, the Levites, and to the judge who is in those days, and shall inquire. And they shall declare to you the word of right ruling. And you shall do according to the word which they declare to you from that place which Yahweh chooses. And you shall guard to do according to all that they instruct you. Do according to the Torah in which they teach you, according to the right ruling which they say to you. 
You do not turn to the right or to the left from the word which they declare to you. And the man who acts arrogantly so as not to listen to the priest who stands to serve there before Yahweh or Elohim or to the judge, that man shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. And let all the people hear and fear and no longer do arrogantly. When you come to the land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you and shall possess it and shall dwell in it, and you shall say, let me set a sovereign over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall certainly set a sovereign over you whom Yahweh your Elohim shall choose. Set a sovereign over you from among your brothers. You are not allowed to set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he is not to increase horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Mitzrayim to increase horses. For Yahweh has said to you, do not return that way again. And he is not to increase wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor is he to greatly increase silver and gold for himself. And it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his reign, that he shall write for himself a copy of this Torah and a book from, one, from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, so that he learns to fear Yahweh, his Elohim, and guard all the words of this Torah and these laws to do them, so that his heart is not lifted up above his brothers, and so as not to turn aside from the command, right or left, so that he prolongs his days in his reign, he and his children in the midst of Yisrael. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Next up, we have Miss Kathy. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Miss Kathy, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless her and her family, and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of our hands. Amen. All right. You're going to take us into chapter 18, reading verses 1 through 12. The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi have no part or inheritance with Israel. They are to eat the offerings of Yahweh made by fire and his inheritance. But among his brothers, Levi has no inheritance. Yahweh is his inheritance as he has spoken to him. And this is the priests right ruling from the people from those who slaughter a slaughtering, whether it is a bull or sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach, the first fruits of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the first of the fleece of your sheep you give to him. For Yahweh, your Elohim, has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand to serve in the name of Yahweh him and his sons forever. And when the Levite comes from one of your gates, from where he has sojourned among all Israel, and shall come with all the desire of his being to the place which Yahweh chooses, then he shall serve in the name of Yahweh, excuse me, Yahweh his Elohim. Like all his brothers, the Levites, who are standing there before Yahweh, they are to have portion for portion to eat, besides what comes, what comes from the sale of his inheritance. When you come into the land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you, do not learn to do according to the abominations of those nations. Let no one be found among you who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices divination, or a user of magic, or one who interprets omens, or a so sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritus, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these are an abomination to Yahweh, and because of these abominations, Yahweh, your Elohim, drives them out from before you. Amen. Thank you so much. Ms. Kathy, you. you're welcome. Next we have Shaquez. 
He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may bless Shaquez, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless her and her family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of our hands. Amen. You're going to take us from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. Be perfect before Yahweh your Elohim. For these nations whom you are possessing do listen to those using magic and to diviners. But as for you, Yahweh your Elohim has not appointed such for you. Yahweh your Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brothers. Listen to him. According to all you asked of Yahweh your Elohim in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my Elohim, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And Yahweh said to me, What they have spoken is good. I shall raise up for them a prophet like you out of the midst of their brothers, and I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be, the man who does not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name, I require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other mighty ones, even that prophet shall die. And when you say in your heart, how do we know the word which Yahweh has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, and the word is not, or comes not, that is the word which Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet had spoken it presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Amen. Thank you, Shaquess. All right, next up we have Eduardo. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may bless Eduardo, who's come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of his hands. Amen. All right, Eduardo, you're going to take us chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. When Yahweh your Elohim cuts off the nations whose land Yahweh your Elohim is giving you, and you dispossess them and dwell in their cities and in their houses, separate three cities for yourself in the midst of your land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you to possess. Prepare a way for yourself and divide into three parts the border of your land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you to inherit, that any manslayer shall flee there. In this matter of the manslayer who flees there and lives, he who strikes his neighbor unknowingly, not having hated him in time past, even he who goes to the forest with his neighbor to cut timber, and his hand swings a stroke with the ax to cut down the tree, and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies, let him flee to one of these cities and live. Lest the revenger of blood, while his displeasure is hot, pursue the manslayer and overtake him, because the way is long and shall strike his being, though he, he was not worthy of death, since he had not hated him before. Therefore, I am commanding you, saying, separate three cities for yourself. And if Yahweh, your Elohim, enlarges your border, as he swore to your fathers, and has given you the land which he promised to give to your fathers, when you guard all his command to do it, which I am commanding you today, to love Yahweh, your Elohim, and to walk in his ways all the days, then you shall add three cities, three more cities for yourself besides these three, so that innocent blood is not shed in the midst of your land, which Yahweh, your Elohim, is giving you as an inheritance, or blood guilt shall be upon you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eduardo. Next up, we have Miss Janet. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may bless Miss Janet, who's come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless her and her family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of her hands. Amen. All right, you're going to take us through uh, verse 11 to the end of the chapter. But when anyone hates his neighbor and shall lie in wait for him, and rise against him and strike his being so that he dies, then he shall flee to one of these cities. And the elders of his city shall send and bring him from there, and give him into the hand of the revenger of blood, and he shall die. Your eyes shall not pardon him, but you shall purge the blood of innocent blood from Israel, so that it might be well with you. Do not remove your neighbor's boundary, which those in the past have set in your inheritance, which you inherit in the land that Yahweh your Elohim is giving you to possess. One witness does not rise against a man concerning 
any crookedness or any sin that he commits. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses, a matter is established. When a malicious witness rises up against any man to accuse him of turning aside, then both men who have the dispute shall stand before Yahweh, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. And the judges shall diligently search and see if the witness is a false witness who has falsely accused his brother. Then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from your midst and let the rest hear and fear and never again do this evil matter in your midst. And let your eye not pardon lie for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Amen. Thank you, Miss Jana. Next up, we have Chris. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may bless Chris, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of his hands. Amen. All right, you're going to take us into chapter 20, Chris, reading verses 1 through 9. When you go out to battle against your enemies and shall see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, for Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you up from the land of Mitzrayim, is with you. And it shall be when you draw near to the battle that the priest shall come and speak to the people and shall say to them, Hear, O Yisrael, you are drawing near today to battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint, nor do not fear or tremble or be afraid before them. For Yahweh your Elohim is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officers shall speak to the people, saying, Who is the man who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And who is the man who has planted a vineyard and has not begun to use it? Let him also go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man should begin to use it. And who is the man who is engaged to a woman and has not taken her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Who is the man who is afraid and tender of heart? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brothers faint like his heart. And it shall be when the officers have Finish speaking to the people that they shall appoint commanders of the divisions to lead the people. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. All right. Next up, we have Grayson. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may bless. Grayson has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of his hands. Amen. All right. You're going to take us from verse 10 through verse 20. Well, to the end of the chapter. When you draw near to a city to fight against it, then you shall make a call for peace to it. And it shall be that if it accepts your call for peace and shall open to you, then all the people found in it are to be your compulsory labor and serve you. But if it does not make peace with you and shall fight against you, then you shall besiege it. And Yahweh your Elohim shall give it into your hands, and you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. Only the woman and the little ones and the livestock and all that is in the city, all its spoil you take as plunder for yourself. And you shall eat the enemy's plunders, plunder which Yahweh your Elohim gives you. Do so to all the cities which are very far from you, which are not of the cities of these nations, only of the cities of the peoples which Yahweh your Elohim gives you as an inheritance. You do not keep alive any that breathe, but you shall certainly put them under the ban, the Hittite and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite, and Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations which they have done for their mighty ones, and you sin against Yahweh your Elohim. When you besiege a city for a long time, fighting against it to take it, you do not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. If you do eat of them, do not cut them down. For is the tree of the field a man to be, bese be besieged by you? Only the trees which you know are not trees for food you do destroy and cut down. To build siege works against the city that is fighting against you until it falls. Amen. Thank you, Grayson. Next up, we have his wife, Taylor. Did I say that out loud? Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> he who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may bless tailors, come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless her and her family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of her hands. Amen. All right, you're our last reader. You're going to take us from verse 21 uh, into chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. When anyone is found slain, lying in the field, in the land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you to possess, and it is not known who struck you, then your elders and your judges shall go out, and they shall measure the distance from the slain man to the cities round about. And it shall be that the elders of the city nearest to the slain man shall take a heifer which has not been worked and which has not pulled with a yoke, and the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a wadi with flowing water, which is neither plowed nor sown, and they shall break the heifer's neck there in the wadi. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near, for Yahweh your Elohim has chosen them to serve him and to bless in the name of Yahweh and be their mouth. Every strife and every stroke is tried. And let all the elders of that city nearest to the slain men wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the wadi. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, nor have our eyes seen it. O Yahweh, forgive your people, Israel, whom you have ransomed, and do not allow innocent blood in the midst of your people, Israel, and the blood guilt shall be pardoned to them. Thus you purge the guilt of the innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in the eyes of Yahweh. Amen. Thank you, Taylor. Next up, we're going to bring up Rabbi Steve. That's Rabbi Steve. No. <laughs> Somehow they made grace in the most happy right there. <laughs> I can't imagine why. All right. Excellent job by the readers. All right, the traditional blessing after the Torah reading. Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lano Torah te'emet v'chayei olam natah betochenu. Baruch atah Yahweh noten ha-Torah, amen. Amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us a Torah of truth and has planted eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. All right, now, I know you're all excited to hear Grayson come up and do the announcements, but I'm going to do them today. <laughs> that was quite a mixed reaction. <laughs> all right, so we had a lot of new things in there, and he wanted to get more practice and hear what I have to say about them, so we're going to get a little bit more in here. All right, so let's begin by welcoming our guests. We have guests online today especially. Let's welcome them. Anybody here in the building want to welcome them? All right. And we are children of Avraham, so we do want to exemplify the trait of hospitality. Okay, Avraham was known for his hospitality, so let's make people feel welcome. And if you're a guest, we simply ask that you would act like a guest. I mean, you know, we, we get people that visit on, on a regular basis who are wonderful and fantastic, and occasionally some that are not so fantastic in the way they act towards us, okay? And look, we don't expect that everything we do here is gonna be according to your liking, especially when we get to the discussion part and you may disagree with some of the things that I say. That's perfectly okay. We just ask you to be polite about it or if it's bad enough or you really don't like it or you're not, you, know, you disagree, then just, you know what? You're on YouTube, you just click on something else. I mean, it's not that, not that hot, you know, hard to do. All right, so we do wanna welcome our guests. Hopefully you'll get something out of this today that'll be a blessing. We do stream twice a week, so I want to kind of give you guys, if you're a guest, an idea of the things that we do. Now, before I get into this, this is not anything to sell. I don't have anything to promote from that. These are all things that I believe would benefit you that are free, okay, that we provide without charge, okay? So we stream every Shabbat, every Saturday at 1.15 Eastern Time. The service runs till about 5.30, so it's a good little bit of time. And we sing, we dance, we take prayer time, we have liturgy, we have teaching, we have questions and answers with the teaching. It's just a full day of fantastic stuff, okay? That's every Saturday live on YouTube at 1.15. The exception being occasionally during a feast, if there's a Saturday during that feast, we may schedule it a little bit later in the day or a different time. But otherwise, 1.15 is the start. So at 1 o'clock, 
we actually have the stream start, the live part of it doesn't start to 1.15. First 15 minutes is going to be clips like these with the announcements on it, or maybe a clip from an, uh, you know, a teaching or something, or some music from the praise team. So things that are going on for the first 15 minutes, then we start live with the sounding of the shofar at quarter after. All right, we also stream on Tuesdays, like right now, right? Torah time. This is what we call Torah Tuesdays, okay? Torah Study Tuesdays. And we started this about 40, 45 minutes ago at 6.30, okay? So every Tuesday at 6.30, we go through the weekly Torah portion, which is the one-year cycle of going through the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy. It's about four or five chapters a week, like we did chapter 16, 18 through 21. So it's about that right range. Okay, today... And so we go through this one-year cycle. We're now in the book of Devarim and Deuteronomy. So we're getting close to the end because the Torah portion cycle runs from Sukkot to Sukkot. Okay? So that's from, from tabernacles to tabernacles. All right. So it runs about three hours, give or take. And, and so you're welcome to come and watch those. By the way, all these things are archived on our, on our uh, YouTube channel. Probably have 3,000 almost videos on the YouTube channel, 2,000 plus. So you can certainly watch and enjoy all of those. All right, then we have a children's program called Parsha Pearls. It goes along with the same Torah portion cycle, okay? The Parsha Pearls program is at ymtoi.org. We have a separate website for our youth program. Again, it's free. Fantastic program put together by Rebbe and Julie. All right. And her tremendous staff of artists and editors and, and proofreaders and craft developers and everything. And this program is in the form of a PDF. We have actually two different ones for two different age groups. We've got your gem sne your <laughs> sneakers. We've got your sneakers. No, your gem seekers, which are ages five through eight, and your pearl seekers, ages nine through 12, with also including the older children, the teenagers, who would really go up to about 19, okay? Now, I did say 99 plus on the slide, because I think everybody can benefit from the program. So what you're gonna get is 35 pages approximately each week all connected to that week's Torah portion. So everything I'm about to list is Torah portion specific every week. You're going to get child-friendly stories and lessons, lesson questions, Hebrew word studies, which is several of the words from that week's Torah portion in the form of like a flashcard that you could print out, uh, memory verses, word searches, crossword puzzles, mazes, crafts, notebook pages, coloring pages, even a song and a snack. Okay, imagine that, even a snack related to the Torah portion. Okay, so like when we did the Ten Commandments, they actually made a scroll, like a, like a Torah scroll using pretzel sticks and fruit roll-ups, and they made a Torah scroll. It was great. And they got to eat it as well. All right, bringing new meaning to may his word be on my lips, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, so enjoy this program. It is free. It publishes on Sundays, so you have it for the whole week. So like we're doing Shof Team this week. That published on Sunday a couple of days ago. And then a lot of the rest of the world does these things on Saturday. So this is the, for the upcoming Saturday. So our children will be doing that this Shabbat, the Shoftim lesson on Shabbat. Okay. You could use it in your homeschooling, use it in your Sabbath schools. If you have any questions, you could always contact us. We'll put you in touch with uh, the Rebbitson, and she can answer any questions you have about the program. All right. Now, then we have audio scripture readings. These are done by our own Shira Wendling. Yeah, fantastic job, Shira. Okay, so Shira has given us a recording from Genesis to Revelation. The first five books are broken up by Torah portions. So if you want to, you know, hear this week's Torah portion, you can listen to just that specifically. Free, downloadable on the MTOI site. Like I said, again, on the media, under the scripture readings. All right, enjoy those. Okay, so we do have things that we publish on YouTube every day of the week, five days a week. So on Mondays, we publish what's called a first look. First look is like a preview in the movie theater for the upcoming movie, right? So it's sound bites, little clips from the teaching that's going to come out on Wednesday. So to get you kind of excited and, and kind of ready for it, right? So these are powerful sound bites from each week's full teaching. So that's on, on Mondays. Then on Tuesdays, we publish what's called MTOI Shorts which are also from that week's uh, teaching. These are 10 little one-minute clips. And so utilizing YouTube's now feature of, you know, of being able to put these short things. So we publish those on Tuesday. Wednesday, you get the full teaching, okay, which we're in the series now called Be Set Apart. So that's every Wednesday. Thursdays is the afterburn. 
Okay, which is after each teaching, I also take questions, people's thoughts, comments, etc., give answers to whatever it is about what I just taught. So that way, there could be an interaction to figure out, did you understand and receive what I said the way I intended it? And so that is published on Thursday. So the Thursday, okay, is connected to the same thing. So Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday are all connected. Actually, Tuesday also. All of those first four days of the week are connected to the same teaching. Friday's a little different. Friday, we publish an In Focus. It's a short video that focuses on topics that have to do with our relationships, either with each other or with our creator. And these are like mini teachings that were embedded as a part of a bigger teaching. In other words, I happened to go off on a little side trail and it kind of cohesively held its own that made sense to pull it out and make it a separate little thing, okay? And so they're, a lot of times they're humorous, thought-provoking, sometimes just simply provoking. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes they make you go, probably often go, he said what? And so that's kind of fun to go through. Sometimes I do that. I look at the title and I go, I got to listen to this. I don't remember what I said that had to do with that. Because the titles are almost always something that I actually said. And I'm thinking, okay, messianic whack-a-mole. Okay, let's see what in the world that was about. All right, so those are on Fridays, okay? And then we have some live programming. So our live programming, we have a thing called Torah Teens. All right, the Torah Teens program is instructed by our own rabbi, Tom Mitchell. This is every Thursday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's hosted on Zoom, which is a video chat software, right? So to get the link to the Zoom room, email us at TorahTime at MTOI.org. TorahTime at MTOI.org. We may need to change that to TorahTeens at MTOI.org. We'll get that changed. Let's remember to do that. But right now, it's TorahTime at MTOI.org. Okay? I know it says, no, the, but the, the email still says TorahTime because that's the one we have. Okay, Rabbi Tom's saying it does say Torah teens. I know that, but it doesn't, the email address I want to fix. All right, so we'll fix that. But right now, send an email to TorahTime at MTOI.org, and you will get the link. It's an autoresponder, so you don't have to worry about what time of day you send it. Just send it. You'll get the responder there. I wouldn't wait till like, two minutes to one o'clock, because sometimes the ether does not work, the internet doesn't work that quickly, and you may not get that response. Sometimes you get it immediately, sometimes maybe five minutes. So... You can go ahead and go get it right, you know, after the study tonight. Just get it when it's convenient. All right. So then we have what's called our zone meetings, okay, our zone meetings. So I have a desire. I, I've been given, I think, a, a desire, birthed in me, a desire to meet the needs of people wherever they are, right, just to provide stuff as best I can to serve what they need wherever they are. And some of the people don't live here, at least not yet. Anyway, <laughs> that's changing, it seems, rapidly. Okay, but, you know, there's people all over the world as part of this, you know, community that we're kind of working together with, and it's not Shabbat where they are when it's Shabbat where we are. And so we wanted to do something on Shabbat where they are at least once a month. So we have broken up the world based on the word time zones into zones, right? So it's really three or four time zones together or five time zones together in a zone. So zone one is really not even within the time zone. Zone one is gonna be just the people who are physically here in this building. And this is a chance for them to ask questions about anything scripturally, right? Emphasis being on things that affect your walk. Not just, you know that verse over here where it says this? I've always wondered what that means. Well, if it doesn't actually have anything to do with your walk, we probably don't need that as much as the things that have to do with how you do what you're supposed to do, okay? All right, now. So the Zone 1 meeting is for is during the service, the first Saturday of the month, during Shabbat services, right here locally, instead of the teaching time. We take the whole two hours or so, and we answer questions. All right? So that's coming up this coming Saturday, right? So we got that coming up Saturday, September the 3rd. Now, then we get into our Zone 2 meetings. So Zone 2 is like the United Kingdom, Europe, Africa, the places that are six, seven, eight hours ahead of us or so, okay? Give or take. There are some that are kind of between zones, but, you know, in that six, seven, eight hour range, nine hour range. And so obviously when we have our services and I don't start teaching until about 3, 3.30 in the afternoon here, that's already 9, 9.30 or later where they are with, and it's already after sundown. So 10 o'clock in the morning on the second Saturday of the month, 
we'll do a Zoom meeting like we do with the teenagers, but this is a, a different link you're gonna need. So we have a Zoom meeting for the Zone 2 people on the second Saturday of every month at 10 a.m. That's coming up on the 10th, September the 10th, so 10 a.m. And so you email us at zoom at mty.org. Okay, and that same link will work for Zone 2, Zoom Zone 1, and Zone 3, okay? Now, all of these meetings, just to interrupt myself for a second, all these meetings, everybody's welcome to come. So they're not exclusive. The only exclusive aspect is who gets to ask the questions. Only the people that live in the zone that's being focused on that week get to ask the questions, right? But the rest of you are all welcome to come and hear the answers, hear the questions, and interact with everybody. It's fantastic. We usually end up with about 130 or so plus computers logged on to these things. There's, there's a lot of people. It's great. All around the world. It's so much fun to see all these different people everywhere going through the same <laughs> stuff we are, you know, having the same types of questions. All right. I mean, I can't tell you how many times someone came up to me and said, I was going to ask you a question, but you covered it in the zone meeting when somebody else asked it. Happens all the time. All right, so zone two. Then we have Zoom zone one. So the, we used to do zone one, people that live not here, but in these time zones, and people that do live here, at the same time realize there's too many. So it's not being fair to everybody. So we have a separate one on the third Friday of the month for the people that live, US, Canada, Mexico, South and Central Americas, the islands that are sort of connected with all that, all in those same range of time zones on the third Friday of the month at 8 p.m. And that again is on Zoom, same link will work, okay? Again, it's an autoresponder, just email us, it'll come back. And then two hours later, we're gonna do zone three. All right, zone three is Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, China, um, let's see, who did I leave out? Fiji, and we've got a lot of places, India, all places that we have people that attend these meetings. And that's on the third Friday, also at 10 p.m. Because they're about 16 hours, 12 to 16 hours ahead of us. So when we do this at 10 p.m., the Philippines, it's 10 a.m. Australia, that's more like one in the afternoon or two in the afternoon or later. Okay? So we want to cover when it's still Shabbat where they are. Amen? Amen. Okay, so that's our zone meetings. Everybody is welcome. Please come. You'll have a fantastic time. And you'll enjoy them. Just remember that the people that, well, I'll remind, remind everybody when we have the meetings, who gets to ask the questions, right? It's, if you live in that zone, that's the time to ask your questions. Now, if you don't want to get on a camera or a microphone and ask your questions, then you can still email them to us, okay? They go to Rabbi Tom first primarily, and then he comes and gets me if it's something that he thinks I should be answering. And so you can mail them to, email them to questions at mty.org. Or you can go to the Contact Us page on our website, mtui.org slash contact us. Scroll down to the bottom of the page, and there's a form you can fill out right there on the bottom of the page and ask your question, all right? If your question is urgent, let me explain what that is. It has to be addressed. You need it to be addressed, like, in the next couple of days because whatever you need it for is happening in the next couple of days. Not something that's been irritating you for 30 years and you just need to know. Okay, you can wait another couple of weeks or days. But I want to make sure we're helping people, because in the past I've been guilty of not looking at these things quickly enough. And somebody will ask a question about an upcoming office party sort of around the holiday, you know, pagan day season. Should I go to it or not go to it? Or do I take the Christmas bonus? Or these are the kind of questions that will come up right around when they're happening. And then if I answer it in March, it's a little late when they ask the question in December when they need it answered, okay? So if you have something that's time sensitive, then please just write urgent on the email. Now, if you write urgent and it's not time sensitive, we'll just move you to the back of the list. It's not a big deal, you know, so don't get offended if we do that. We'll just go, that wasn't time sensitive and we'll push you to the end of the list. All right, is that fair? We're gonna try to get to them all as fast as we can either way. All right, we just want you to be respectful. All right, so that being said, let me say a few more things about contacting us before we go to the next thing. <laughs> Elder's already smiling. He's like, oh, here we go. Look, I don't know how I can say this politely, all right? Because I don't want you to get offended. And some of you have been calling lately. You've probably heard a little snappiness out of both the elder and myself because I don't think that you guys understand the role that we have in your life or the role that's appropriate for us to have. 
Let me tell you what we do, and we're covering it this week, actually, in the Torah portion. Our role is to advise, guide, counsel, answer questions, instruct. It is not our role to be your best friend. It is not our role to listen to all of your sob stories and all of your drama. Go get a friend. Phone a friend. Actually, I'm going to say that next time. Listen, you just need to go phone a friend. Because I got people mad at me because I won't listen to their whole story. I'm said, I'm sorry. It's not my job to listen to your whole story. What is your question? What is your issue? And if I need your story to answer your question or guide you, then I'll ask for it. But we have a lot of people out there, and I understand this. I'm not picking on it, who need to be heard. Good. Go find someone who wants to listen. Because there are people that like to listen. I'm not saying that in any kind of mean way. I get a 30-minute block of time to maybe squeeze in a person's issues or whatever it is. I try to actually do it in more like 15 minutes so I can have time to do a few other things. I don't, that, your story takes longer than that. Then I don't have time to even address what you need. Okay? I know some of you want to be friends because I've got people saying, well, I'd like to call every week. Only if you have a question every week. Like a question in your life that has to do with your walk. We're not the Bible answer man here when you call for appointments. Okay? You're calling for an appointment because you have a need, halakhically, for your walk. Or in your life, you need guidance, counsel, or advice with things that you're struggling with. So don't get mad at me when I tell you this is what you need to do, and you go, I don't know what to do. I say, well, then you need to go figure it out. And you're looking at me like, well, why? Won't you just tell me what to do? No. In life, there are things I'm going to tell you you need to go figure out. So if I tell you, and this happens like every week, 15 times a week, if I tell you you need to go get a job, then you start asking me about what you should do, get a job, that's what you should do. And then you don't know what to do or how to do it, figure it out. Somehow the rest of the three, five billion people, whatever it is on the planet, figured it out. And you can figure it out too. Do I sound like I'm being harsh and mean? Yes, good. Now, the reason I say it that way is because <laughs> are we going to grow up? And everybody's thinking, oh, but Rabbi, you're just so mean the way. Look, you know what? You've been coddled your whole ridiculously long time of your life. Okay, you've been coddled and coddled and coddled. How are you going to handle anything if you can't take care of basic needs for yourself? I'm not trying to get all of you that are struggling depressed. Look, look at the camera, look me in the eye. All you people, look me in the eye. There is nobody out there, okay, that doesn't have people in the same type of situation that have figured it out. Did you receive that? Whatever you've got, you've got a degenerative disease, you've got depression, you've got this, you've got that. Somebody else, many somebody else, has have exactly all that and they figured it out. They figured out ways to work around their problem, ways to get a job, ways to do, provide for themselves, ways to take care of themselves. Okay, so some of the people that have been most successful in counseling, all I did was kick them. Like, kick them, like, into motion, okay? Not kick them, like, when they're down, but, like, I prodded them and said, go. You can do it, right? Right? Okay? I mean, there's lots of people that I didn't give them the answer. I just said, go, get it done. And told them they could. Because... We're not getting, some of you are thinking, well, Rabbi, what about all those programs you promised us? Well, stop calling with all the nonsense, and I might be able to develop the programs. Billy's laughing. <laughs> Look, I don't mind helping you when you need help. Problem is, at least half the phone calls are completely of no point. At least. They were unnecessary. They're just people that are so needy and lost, and they just don't want to make the effort to do it themselves. Okay? Figure it out. But you're like, but I don't know what to do. Then you get, you get advice, and then I tell you what, this is what you need to go figure out. Go figure this out, but then you still have to go figure it out. Okay? Stop thinking in that mainstream Christian thing that somehow somebody outside of you is going to do it all for you or just hand it to you. 
Because that's what you try to do. And you know what? Elder won't do it either. You guys think you're smart. You're slick. You avoid me and go to him. I listen to him most of the day because the doors are open and I can hear the calls. And he's sitting there going, no, no. And people are not listening to him anymore. They listen to me. And he's saying, no. (laughs) And then I walk over when he's going too long and I say, look. And I interrupt and I say, where is this going? Because he's so nice. Which is why they go to him. And I have to walk in and say, excuse me, this is rabbi. Why are you not listening to what elder's telling you? Why is there no question? What is the question? Oh, I just don't feel like I'm being heard. We be- I look at the phone. You've been on for 36 minutes. You've been heard. That happened today. Well, I, just, I just don't feel like I'm being heard. How much more time do you need? You've been talking for 36 minutes. Go find a friend. I don't even mean that as a wise guy thing. If you, everybody needs somebody they can talk to, so go find one. All right, that has nothing, this, this has nothing to do with the Torah portion and everything to do with the Torah portion this week. That's why I'm not feeling bad going in that direction right now, okay? Because this Torah portion starts out with appoint judges to help you with issues that come up that you don't know what to do. First verse, 16, 18 says appoint judges, then you get into 17, which is all about when you have an issue and you don't know what to do. And we're going to hit that pretty hard today when we get there in a minute. All right, so please call us when you need us. I tell that to everybody. Call us when you need us. Okay? And if, and if you need us, then we're going to do Deuteronomy 17, and you're going to hear what I have to say. And you're either going to accept that or not. And I got a lot of people. I had one person today just said, you know what? I'm done with your ministry because they didn't like what I had to say. I said, good. You're not ready for this. Okay, you don't want to own your stuff and do what we, he told that person four times the same thing and she ignored him, okay? And so after she hung up, he looked at me, I said to him, was that all right? He goes, it was perfect. (laughs) I don't know how to explain this to you. We said this the other day on, on Sabbath, or I think it was Sabbath or Tuesday, we said, that inner man if it doesn't get its act together, is not spending forever in a forever suit. Okay? And stop looking for me, Billy, Tom, any of the re- leadership to make that happen for you. I can advise you, instruct you, I can guide you. You have to do. Okay? And some of you on the phone, sometimes I have to give it credit because it's 50-50 at times. I'm like, they're either going to get it or they're going to hang up. So I'm just warning you guys. I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to be excited because you're going to get the truth, maybe for the first time in your life, unadulterated, not, not cleaned up and fancy, just straight truth and reality about your life when you call. If that's what you want, please call. All right? But if you want it to be anything but that, whatever you want to put there, don't call here. We don't have time for that. I'm not talking about time, meaning like I've got better things to do. I, there are people that actually want to change and grow. I'd rather help them. Okay? I'll counsel all day long if it's that. But if you're going to waste our time because you really just want to talk and not listen then don't. Because some of you are thinking, oh, now I'm really petrified to call. No, get excited about it. Listen to the testimonies of the people that have come up and tell you that they got some pretty strong stuff and it made all the difference. Or they didn't listen and it went badly. Now it made all the difference or whatever it is. Listen to those things. The ministry has an important role to play. But that role is not to live your life and to make all your decisions. That is not our role. Go join a cult if you want that. You know, all these people out there say we're a cult? There's your proof that we're not. Because you try to get us to act like a cult and we won't. Not going to do those things. That undermines his purpose. What did I teach you in that one single part teaching that making decisions yourself... You making decisions is why you exist. Not so I would make them for you or somebody else would make them for you. 
Your whole existence is so he can watch you make choices. One of those choices might be to get guidance. One of those choices will be what you do with the guidance. But these are still your choices. I'm not going to make you do anything. Although when you call us back and it's all a mess, we'll ask you, did you do what I told you last time? And you say, no. I say, then why are you calling this time? He says that. Elder says the same exact thing. Did you do what Rabbi told you last time? No. Then why are you calling me? Go back and do what he told you to do. Right? He says that all the time. Did you talk to Rabbi yet? Yeah. Did he tell you what to do yet? Yeah. Did you do what he said? No. Then you know what to do. All right. You know, I got a coffee mug that says, if at first you don't succeed, go back and do what Rabbi told you to do first. Okay? It's a great coffee gub. What'd you say? No, I don't, but I got lots of coffee gubs. He said, you don't drink coffee. No, I drink tea, though, but I got lots of coffee gubs people are giving me. All right. What are we up to now? Erev Shabbat coming up first Friday of the month. All right, a couple of days. So this Friday at 7, we're having our Erev Shabbat meal here. Those of you that are local, come. We do it the same way we do on Shabbat, bring it picnic style, etc. We're going to do our service at 7. So try to be here a little bit earlier. We'll try to start promptly at 7, which means probably 7.15, because I know we have people at Stragglers to get in there. I did make it later to make it more conducive. So those of you that, when it was 6.30, showed up at 6.45, I don't want to see you here at 7.15. You don't need to still be 15 minutes late. I gave you an extra half an hour, <laughs> okay? Because some of you, no matter what time I make it, you're going to be 15 minutes late. I gave you an extra half an hour. So let's try to be here on time, start the service at 7 o'clock. That is not something we stream, by the way, but we will be doing that here locally. All right, then we have our leadership council meeting on the 11th. All right. Okay, so that's at noon. Please pray for your leadership. That's the local and international leadership meeting together. All right, so there's about 20-something leaders from around the world, 25 or so leaders from around the world. We get together once a month. All part of it. These are all leaders who are part of MQI, not just random leaders, okay? These are people that have spent, most of them, years in commitment to figuring out how we can work together to serve you effectively on behalf of the Father. All right, that's our whole vision right there. All right, then we have a challenge coming up. So... I haven't done a challenge in a long time. So the challenge is the Song of Ascents challenge. So the Song of Ascents is the 15 verses, uh, Psalms from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. All right, those 15 Psalms. And we're going to start on Sunday the 11th, and it goes till Sunday the 25th, all right, which is the day before Rosh Hashanah. So it'll give you the two weeks before Rosh Hashanah to read these songs that were read on the stairs to go up into the temple. Hold on a I thought I was going to sneeze there for a second. All right, so I want you to read each one in the morning. They're short. I mean, some of them are like three verses. Some of them are five or six. I mean, they're not long psalms. Read the psalm in the morning. Try to be mindful of any piece out of it that you kind of were stirred about, like they kind of, kind of, kind of connected with you. And then at the end of the day, look back and, and see what effect, if anything, it had that you were aware of that psalm all day. Okay? So you could do that for 15 days. I think it would be very cool. All right. Then we have coming up our ladies' craft cutting party on Sunday the 18th. All right? Okay. As we get ready for Sukkot, we do have a lot of prep work for Sukkot for the children's program, including pre-cutting a lot of the materials for the crafts. And so we do this before each of our events. And there will be, I'm sure, beverages and snacks provided. So just come ready to enjoy. If you want details, ask Rebus and Julie, and she'll let you know, or Betty, because they're going to be running this. So just let them know, and they'll give you the details. Okay. Then Rosh Hashanah is coming, our first fall holy day. <laughs> Somebody asked the other day, when's the Rosh Kodesh next one coming up? Um, that's it right there. Okay. All right, Rosh Kodesh for the month of Tishrei is also Rosh Hashanah, which is the counting of years, okay? If you're online and you're all mad that I called it Rosh Hashanah, too bad. I don't really <laughs> want to get into a fight about it, okay? Um, it's an appropriate name for the day, okay? In Leviticus 25, it talks about the counting of years, the Shemitah, the Jubilee, the Ovel, and it's counted in the, starting in the month of Tishrei. 
okay, right after Yom Kippur. So we can call it Rosh Hashanah without any problems. Okay, some of you are going, oh, but it's Yom Truah. Well, it doesn't even say that in Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 calls it Zikron Truah. So for all you geniuses out there who didn't know that, you're thinking, oh, okay, so be careful. You got to go back, look at the Hebrew, know what you're talking about. All right? All right. If you wonder why the attitude is, because I get, for 25 years, I get to hear this stuff. Okay? So it gets a little exhausting. All right. Then 10 days later, it's Yom Kippur. Okay. So wait. I forgot to say when Rosh Hashanah is. So it's on Monday the 26th. Okay, so you can go back to that slide. Rosh Hashanah is on Monday the 26th. Okay, so we'll be meeting here at the normal time, 1.15. With the Oneg afterwards, just like we do on a Saturday. Okay? All right, now Yom Kippur is on the Wednesday the 5th. All right, so I still haven't figured out what time I want to start that. It probably will be either 5 or 5.30. Okay, something like that. Because... The actual slide service runs an hour and 28 minutes or something, like, two hours, like an hour and a half. But last year, I ended up going almost three hours because I did announcements and I did prayer time and I talked for a little bit. So I'm not really sure what I want to do yet. Sundown is about 7.30. Like sundown is 7.18, but it's not really dark till like 7.30. So sundown's around 7.30. About when I, uh, remember, I will announce it so we're not starting to eat until I say so. But... I want to see what time we'll start so that the service will end close to that. And then we'll just reset the room and we'll eat. So we're going to break the fast together if you would like to do that. Bring your food. Don't sample it. Bring your food. We'll put it in the back and make sure that none of those wonderful smells are coming into the room to distract you. And um, actually, uh, Elder, we should have fans blowing that in here just to, just, to, just to really get them to fast good, you know. I'm teasing. Um, so it's a full day of fasting, no eating, no drinking, 24 hours, Tuesday night to Wednesday night, okay? And I will be announcing when we can start eating, at least if you're here. If you want to eat whenever you want to eat, you can go do that somewhere else. But to hear, nobody should be eating until I announce it. We're going to practice some discipline. All right. Then we have Sukkot 2022. All right. So Sukkot is from the 10th to the to the 16th, really, and the 17th, the Shemini Atzeret. But I have it from the 7th to the 18th because it starts on a Monday, which is hard to do as an event. So we're going to start on Friday celebrating Shabbat, not Sukkot. And then on Sunday night, we'll start Sukkot. So people can come Friday. We're going to have services together. We have meals on the schedule to cover you all the way to. We start Sukkot on Sunday night into the 10th. The two holy days are the Mondays, the 10th and the 17th. All right? Right here in Cleveland, Tennessee, if you haven't registered already, I think right now we already have 340 or so plus people, almost 350, who are registered, or something like that. I don't know, Marlene here to tell me how many. But, um, you know, just go ahead and register if you still want to come. If you haven't registered already, our deadline is, is the 23rd. Okay, our deadline's the 23rd. Now, I did have some people call us recently and said, well, what if I won't have the, all the money paid before the 23rd? Well, then if we end up running out of space, then we may contact you to tell you that you don't have your space. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. What I'm just saying is you're not fully registered and locked in until you are fully registered, which means your paperwork's here and your payment is here. Okay? So if you need to make arrangements, call us. We'll tell you it's fine. Just, just understand that at some point that will be more challenging when we actually get maxed out in terms of people, and then we have to you know, to tell people they can't come. Well, I don't want to tell people they can't come, and then you decided you're not coming either, and you only, because you didn't pay yet, and you just figured, all oh, I didn't pay, so it doesn't matter. So let's just be, be aware of that, all right? So to register, call us, 423-250-3020, or online, go to our website, mty.org, slash Sukkot. You can fill out a form right there on the site, save it to your computer, print it out, mail it to us with a check or money order, or you can use Givelify to pay us. If you want to upload it to us and email it to us, that's fine. On the same place on the site where you download the form, there's a place that says upload, and you can put in your name and email address, and then you can upload the form back up to it and send it to us, okay? If that's way too complicated, just call us. We'll talk you through it. Either way. All right. Um, for Sukkot, let me just remind everybody, just I'm going to start throwing this out there. Please bring your color code lanyards, if you have your lanyards, and your little plastic name tag holders. 
That'll save us from having to buy 400 of them every feast. This way we'll only buy some for the few people that are new and don't have them. But try to bring your stuff if you can, your color code lanyards and your uh, name tag holders, okay? All right, if you don't have it, if you lost it, if it got damaged, we will have more for you. But you will do us a favor if you actually bring it, if you have it. It doesn't mean less that we have to buy, okay? Awesome. All right, let me see. I think that's going to cover it for the announcements. Somebody was like, is he ever going to be done with the announcements? Well, actually, we snuck a little bit of the Torah portion into the announcements because we talked about dealing with leadership when you have issues, right? And you have questions. All right, so let's go ahead. Let me pull out my remote brain here, the scriptures. And we're going to start in chapter 16. All right, Deuteronomy. Get a sip of water. All right. And after everything I said during the announcements, Elder owes me a lunch probably. So. <laughs> All right. Although I gave him one today, so I guess it's only worth it. All right. Here we go. Chapter 16 and verse 18. Appoint judges and officers within all your gates according to your tribes. Okay, so this is where we talk about things like anointed and appointed. It says appoint. It doesn't mean these guys just stepped up and decided they were officers and judges. They get appointed. Who do you think appoints them? The people by voting? No. The already existing leadership then anoints and appoints the other leadership. Okay? So let's just keep that in mind. Verse 19, do not distort right ruling through self-serving motives. Okay, so it's talking about do not, you know, show partiality, do not take a bribe, etc. In other words, don't make a judgment call because you've got some benefit because of the way you're going to go. Your decision shouldn't be because you may benefit in some way. Well, I really don't like that person, so good for them. Or they're giving me a bribe, so good for me. Or, you know, you should have no self-interest motive in there. Okay, it's very important for those who are doing the judging. Verse 20. Follow righteousness, righteousness alone, so that you live and inherit the land. Follow. Submit to. Do according to. Get in line with. All these things have the idea of following, okay? Follow righteousness. And this is all why. So that you live and inherit. What's your life all about right now? Figuring out how to live and inherit. Isn't that what we're doing? Right? See, not the mindset that you taught on Sunday church. We're talking about, in reality, you found out how to live so that you can inherit. What are you trying to inherit? The kingdom. Eternal life in the kingdom. That's your inheritance. But you, he says, if you don't do these things, you don't get, you're not going to live and inherit. Follow righteousness and righteousness alone so that you live and inherit the land. Because the land is your metaphor for the kingdom. All right, let's see. Chapter 17. We'll drop down. Okay, verses 2 through 7. When there's found in your midst a man or a woman who does what is evil in the eyes of Yahweh or Elohim and transgressing his covenant. All right, so first of all, it says, Then it has been made known to you, and you have heard and have searched diligently to see if it's true. So, first step, something was made known to you, it was brought to your awareness. Let this be a lesson to all you, I don't want to call you busybodies, but some of you are busybodies. Do not, do not just assume that everything that's made known to you is true. That causes so much damage in the body. Just because somebody shares something with you, okay, did you know such and such, or did you hear about this, did you, don't. Don't jump to conclusions and to judgment because you have not yet done this. He says you have to search diligently to see if it's true. If it, first of all, you should ask the question, does it even involve me? If it doesn't involve me, I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to worry about it. Remember the old, you see something, you go, that's interesting. I wonder if it has anything to do with me. Oh, it doesn't? Okay, then it's interesting. And I move on. 
If it has something possibly, potentially to do with me, I might then have to search out whether or not something is true. Okay? All right. He says, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil matter, if it's true, and stone them to death, that man or woman with stones. But then it teaches us that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses is the only way this putting to death thing can happen. It has to be two to three witnesses who have the same account, and they have to be proven and searched to be genuine and true witnesses. And it says, the hand of the witness shall be first against him to put him to death. And the hand of all the people last. And so this has to do with, when we look at things like um, in Deuteronomy 19.15, it says this again in this Torah portion. It says, one witness does not rise up against a man concerning any crookedness or any sin that he commits, but out of the mouth of two to three, a thing is established. Okay? So things are not established just by two to three. They have to be witnesses in agreement. Establish something. Right? Two to three witnesses. Okay, this is important as we go through this. Also, this is going to be important. I thought I wrote it in my notes. I didn't. Huh. Might be in the next Torah portion. Okay, this is also, by the way, relevant and important to what we're going to read when it comes to John 8, when it talks about the woman caught in adultery. Because what the, what the key verse that you get in John 8 is, he who was out without sin gets to throw the first stone. Well, you just found out that it's the witnesses that get to throw the first stone. So what we need first is to search out the matter to see if it's true that the witnesses have claimed, and if it's true, they get to throw the first stone. And Yeshua basically said, if this is true, which it wasn't, then go ahead. And they knew that it wasn't. See, that throwing the first stone makes, I don't know, no sense. It's just a strange thing if you didn't know the Old Testament. It's like, why would he tell him to throw the first stone? Well, he, was, he was perfect. Go ahead and throw the stone because it's he without sin. He's basically saying, whichever one of you is not a false witness, then you have the right to throw the first stone. So my guess is there weren't any real witnesses there. Oh, but it says she was caught in the very act. We got a lot of issues with that. And who claimed that she was caught in the very act? There wasn't any witnesses. They said they caught her in the very act. Maybe not. Okay, we have a whole lot of teachings that cover John 8, so just so you know. All right, verses 8 through 13. When any matter arises, here we go, chapter 17. This is the big stuff. When any matter arises which is too hard for you to judge. So you got something, you don't know what to do. Okay? So this is dealing with leadership and decisions and right rulings. The matter is too hard for you to judge. You're going to go to the one who stands to serve before Yahweh. All right? That's what it's talking about here. In verse, right? It starts off, it says, sorry, hold on. I turned to chapter 19. Let me get back to 17. It says here, when any matter arises that's too hard for you to judge between blood and blood, plea and plea, or between stroke and stroke, then you shall rise and go up to the place where Yahweh Elohim chooses. Okay, so then you go to the place that Yahweh has put his authority in his name, which is not only Jerusalem, because after all, there was leadership places in other towns in all the different tribes. But you're going to go find those who, look what it says here, to the priest, the Levite, and the judge who is those days, you shall inquire, and they shall declare to you the right ruling. Now, in case you're understanding that any differently, look what it says down in... Um, verse 12, the man who acts arrogantly so as to not listen to the priest who stands to serve there before Yahweh or to the judge, that man shall die. These are people whose role it is to stand to serve before Yahweh. They have a role of authority that Yahweh's put them in. And that role of authority is specific to this kind of judgment. So you're not just going to the plumber to ask questions about your car engine. The auto mechanic isn't helping you with your taxes. You know what I'm saying? You, the people that are, they're targeted in their expertise. Okay? Not that anybody can't do both. I'm just, you understand what I'm saying? So here you're going to the person or people that are appointed, anointed and appointed in the role that's happening here in chapter 17. So you're going to go to that leadership 
Remember, this is when the matter is too hard for you to know what to do. You don't know what to do. So you go to the one who stands before Yahweh. They will declare to you the right ruling, it says. Okay, this is the end of verse 9. And they shall declare to you the word of right ruling. They're going to look at Torah. They're going to understand how Scripture may or may not get involved specifically in whatever you're doing and how to apply it in your life. Because you're asking, I don't know what to do. It says they're going to declare it to you. And you shall guard to do according to all that they instruct you. All right, so this is the steps. You go to the, first of all, you go and find that leadership because you have a situation that's too hard for you to judge. You go to the one who stands before Yahweh. So, by the way, that's, that's important right there. So you don't go to the person because they work the soundboard or run a camera or they're, you know, on the live stream desk. You go to the person who is actually their job to handle and answer and guide and direct and instruct. Because a lot of you will tell us when you go off and do something that you shouldn't do, oh, I went to leadership. And I say, well, who did you go to? And it's not ever actually leadership. It's somebody they perceived had a role and decided it was leadership. No, you need to ask leadership. Who's in leadership? Let's start with the people with titles. You guys don't like titles? That's one of the reasons why there are titles. So you know who's who. You know, when you walk into a dentist's office and only one or two people in there are being called doctor, you know who the dentist is. The title helps. All right? And so you're looking for the elder or the rabbis. What about the shamishes? You're looking for them when it's a physical need. Something physical that you need done, handled, fixed, whatever. Lifted, moved, altered, repaired, something. Okay? They're not answering your halakhic questions. They're not guiding and instructing you on your life and declaring to you right rulings. That's elder or rabbi. Okay? Now, so that was the next step. So it says they're going to declare, and then you shall guard to do according to all that they instruct you. So this is instruction coming from guidance, instruction, that they're declaring to you. And you're going to do according to, you shall, it says. Not like, well, consider strongly what they say. It says you shall guard to do according to all that they instruct you. Do according to the Torah in which they teach you, according to the right ruling which they say to you. You do not turn to the right or the left from the word which they declare to you. Wow. Imagine if you actually approached the leadership from that point of view. Oh, but how do I know I can trust? Well, then don't approach anybody till you can trust. I have no problem with that. Well, go and just see what happens. Prepare to trust. But you can ask enough people here how well it goes when they listen and when they don't listen. It works exactly like it says here. Okay? But you need to understand that when you go, we're not doing opinion polls here in the leadership. We're, we're expecting that when I give you and you do it and it goes badly, that's on me. I have a strong awareness of what I give you and how it may potentially affect you. So I, I, I will tell you, no, I don't know, or I'm just, I'll, I won't get involved in something. But if I give you instruction, I am confident where it comes from, and my expectation is that if you do it, it will work. Okay? It's amazing how many times people will come to me and say, Rabbi, I can't believe it, but that thing you get, I, I did it and it worked. Or they'll say, you were right. I'm like, why are you surprised? No, I'm not saying that with any pride or ego, like I think I'm always right. I know I'm always right in counsel because it's him, not me. I'm not surprised when it works. I'm not surprised when it's right. I expect it to be right and to work. And not because I'm so genius and smart, because I know how I get out of the way. You don't know, you're not in my head. You don't know how when the counsel comes into my mind and comes out of my mouth. But I 
fully expect it to work every time and to be right every time because you need it to be. That's not me claiming, well, Rabbi thinks he's always right. No, I think Yahweh's always right. And if you come to me in a Yahweh-dictated situation, like in Deuteronomy 17 here, I expect you to get what you're supposed to get properly if you do what you're supposed to do, and I expect that it'll give me the right guidance to give you. And just ask the people that do this on a regular basis if it doesn't play out exactly that way. But if you don't approach it that way, it won't. It says, you do not turn to the right or the left from the word which they declare to you. Now look what he says about that. He says, the man who acts arrogantly as to not listen to the priest who stands to serve there before Yahweh, your Elohim, or to the judge, that man shall die, and this is called evil. You'll kill that person to purge the evil, and it's evil because it will cause massive amounts of suffering when people imitate that and don't listen. And we see this throughout the history of Israel. Because massive amounts of suffering because they didn't listen. Usually caused by a few getting the rest not to listen, like the spies and others. You can see this play out on a regular basis. So not listening to the one who stands to serve there before Yahweh is an act of arrogance. And don't get mad at me. He said it, not me. Okay? Now, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, nobody's more arrogant than you, Rabbi. So don't ask me anything. Don't get any help and go find somebody else. I don't care. So you also have to understand. See the shirt? That's my color, okay? From the personality test, the color code. So as a fully red, 87% red person, I love you very much, and I don't care. If you understand what I'm saying, I don't care if you blow yourself up, if you wreck your life, I don't care. Now, some people are thinking, how can he say that? You have to understand, if I cared, I could never do my job. Because every time I watch you people do dumb things and ruin your lives, it would destroy me. Do you understand? Well, so when I say I don't care, I mean I have no emotional investment in what you do and the results you get. So when you come to me to blows up, I look at you like, you know, I told you, <laughs> type of thing. And so remember I said I love you deeply. And that's the caring I have. I care about you deeply, but if you're going to go out and do whatever, what you do with what I give you, I don't care. I know what's going to work, I know what's not going to work, and it's your choice. And I'm not going to force you, I'm not going to beat on you, I'm not going to prod you in any way, I'm just going to say, here it is, go do it. I will tell you you can do it, I'll encourage you, I'll say, this is something you can do. So when you're looking at me and you're expecting me to empathize and sympathize and codependent with you, you're barking up the wrong tree. Okay? People have tried. Not consciously necessarily. I've been frustrated. I will not do that with you. And it's not even a conscious thing. I'm made not to do that. Okay? It's just not in my nature to do that. Ask Elder. He's watched people try it all the time. And I just look at him like, no. Okay? We're just not doing that. You're all thinking, wow, this isn't like anybody I've ever worked with before. Good. We already know what a disaster all that's been. Maybe it's about time you heard somebody tell it to you straight. Some of you are thinking, I knew I should have ate the blue pill and not the red pill. Notice that in the Matrix, the one who gave him the truth was the red pill. There you go. Some of you are thinking, yeah, you are a pill. <laughs> Hard to swallow. All right. Not listening to the one who stands when you, remember, you had a, a problem. You had a matter you couldn't handle. You were seeking guidance. You went to that leader, and now you're not going to listen? Now you're not going to do what they said? So why wouldn't you do what they said? Because I don't like it. I don't agree. I think they're wrong. That's arrogance. Well, it's either arrogance or stupidity. Stupidity meaning you picked the wrong person. Because you may go to somebody and you just don't like what they say. Well, if you didn't go to an actual anointed, appointed person, that's foolishness. If you go to the right person and don't do what they say, that's also foolishness. And it's coming out of arrogance. I told you, we're not playing games with this. And 
the leadership here is getting stronger about this from the point of view of, I don't care what you do with the guidance, but if you're, if you're going to come and waste our time, we're getting too busy for that. There are too many people who want help that are willing to listen that you're wasting time from them getting it. Uh, I've, it's funny because I still have people say to me, well, you know, I didn't want to you know, waste your time. I know you're busy. Look, I'm busy helping people just like whoever said that. So we're not too busy to try to help you if you are actually asking a, a legitimate question for guidance and advice, and you're going to take the advice. Nothing that's outside of the realm of that, okay? If it's a life situation, a financial situation, a relationship situation, whatever it is, I don't need to hear the sob story and the background that you believe I need to have to help you. See, that's part of the reason why you've never gotten the help. You think that that stuff is important. It's not important necessarily to the solution. As a matter of fact, it's mostly what the problem is, is you're focusing on all that trauma, drama, junk. And some of you think, well, how could you possibly, you know, you need to know my story. No, I don't actually. Oh, that's arrogant. No, it's accurate. Because the story is what's blinding you to what needs to be done. The story is cutting out your legs out from under you. The story is making you impotent and you're trying to move forward. And then when you tell the story, guess what? You reinforce it, your emotions jump right back there, and you're right in that place. So go find, call a friend who <laughs> wants to hear your story. I wish I could give you the names of people, hundreds of them, that called up, thought the thing was real complicated, and I fixed it or handled it or gave them what they needed in five minutes. We call that speed counseling. The elder will say, oh, you're doing some speed counseling today because I'll have a call, I'll be done. He's like, you're done? Or, you know, he'll go to me, don't forget your 3 o'clock call. I go, it's already finished. He's like, what? Because if it's anointed, I see it. He gives me the insight. He'll tell you. We're sitting there. He's like, I don't know how you saw that. But I, I, he does that. And that's without all the story. Oh, if I, I might need background details of a situation. I'll ask you. Okay? And then you can share them. And please keep it just to whatever I asked. Not everything you think I need beyond that. Okay? All right. Look, dealing with the vertical structure is not something we were taught or born naturally into. Okay, so learning it and understanding it is tough. So then he says, so not listening is arrogance. The man shall die, okay, who's arrogant, etc." And he says, look, last thing he says, let the people hear and fear and no longer do arrogantly. So you're supposed to hear and fear what he's saying. Now, we're not going to take you out and stone you for acting arrogantly and not listening, but it's not going to go well in your life, and you're going to be held accountable that if others see what you did and know that you came to me and know that you went and did other, they, they're going to imitate you. That's going to be on you. You know? Oh, did you go to rabbi? Yes. What did he tell you to do? Blah, blah, blah. Then they ask you, by the way, did you do it? No. Why not? I mean, you go to ask... You go ready to do. Rabbi, whatever you say, I'm ready to do it. I don't take advantage of that. This is not like a cultish thing where I'm, I don't, I'd be happy if nobody called me. I'd be happy if I had calls all day just to keep the balance there. I don't mind either way. And I don't tell people what to do anyway. I just say, you need to fix this or you need to fix that or you need to do this and I might give you some tools to help you fix it. But you're going to fix it, not me. <coughs> okay? All right. Let's see. Verse 14. We're still in chapter 17. Some of this gets quicker here. When you come in the land which Yahweh Elohim is giving you and shall possess it and shall dwell in it, and you shall say, let me set up a sovereign over me like all the Gentiles that are around me. All right. So they want to set a sovereign. They want a king. So, what, what, what do Gentile kings generally do? They rule your life. They dictate your life. So why would you want one? 
okay? Because the king of the universe is going to just tell you what works and what's right and expect you to do it. And then you're going to have consequences that are natural consequences, but you're not going to have the abusive, tyrannical stuff that a sovereign has, the potential anyway. He said, but when you get to that place that you want this, you're going to set a sovereign over you from among your brothers, and you're not allowed to set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Okay, he says, when you're ready to do all that, because he knew you're going to see all these kingdoms around you, you're going to want what they have. Even though he's already told them over and over again, do not do to me what they do to them. All right. I, why would he allow it then? Because it still teaches us how to deal with authority. It forces you to deal with authority. Continuing here in verse 18. It shall be when the king sits on his throne, he's going to write for himself a copy of the Torah in a book from the one that's before the priests, the Levites. All right, so he's going to make a copy of the scriptures, of the Torah. Now, in the Adventist church, they have some interesting ideas. And one of the interesting ideas is that the Ten Commandments, the commandments were in the ark, okay? But the book that was written and put outside the ark, that's not the same stuff. That's the, you know, ritual laws. And so it doesn't have the same weight. This is why it was outside the ark, not because it was of less value. How could anybody make a copy of it? It was in the ark. Nobody had access to opening, opening up the ark. There's not one verse where anybody ever opened the ark. Once they put everything in it, that was it. Okay? So the king has to make a copy of the one that's before the priest, which is the one that's outside the ark. The Adventists will tell you differently that there's a difference between Torah commands because some are outside the ark and some are inside the ark. No, everything that was in the ark was written on the one outside the ark. But there had to be a copy so that somebody could look at it to make a copy. So, I mean, some of this stuff is just straightforward logic, you know? All right, so the king is to write a copy. Why? So that his heart is not lifted up above his brothers so as to not turn aside from the command right or left so that he prolongs his days and his reign, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Well, we have, it says in Scripture, a potential, a future as a king and a priest. Well, then maybe it makes sense for you to write yourself a copy if you're going to be a sovereign, at least over yourself in the right way. Because he says if you do that, you do it so your heart's not lifted up above your brothers as to turn aside from the command right or left. Here's the problem. Some of you guys, the more you learn Torah, the more you elevate yourself above your brothers. Because <laughs> the arrogance kicks in. I'm right, you're wrong, I'm better, I'm more righteous, and all this other nonsense. The king, remember, he's supposed to do this so he learns to fear Yahweh and guard all the words of the Torah. So let's keep that in mind. All right, let's drop down to chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. Why does Yahweh mention the Levites not having an inheritance over and over and over again? He mentions it like five times just in this chapter. I'm exaggerating. But he does mention it a couple of times. So why? Why is, he, why is it so important to him to keep mentioning this? Okay, we only have things in Scripture being mentioned because the need for that to be known and understood comes up a lot. The more it's mentioned, the more you know it comes up a lot. Is that fair? So if apparently one of the problems is, I don't know that it's Levi wanting to go do other work, but probably people not wanting to give their tithes so that Levi would have their inheritance. So over and over. That's why we read in chapter 14, 15. I got to remember where it was. Give me one second. 14. It talks about, when it talks about the third tithe, it says, and don't forget the Levite. Why would you have to keep reminding them not to forget unless the tendency might be that they would forget? Don't forget to take care of the ones without inheritance. Now, of course, the argument always comes in, well, there are no Levites right now. Well, that's true. 
But there are those, like in chapter 17, that stand before Yahweh to serve, who you need to have available on a 24-7 basis. I believe they fall into the Melchizedekian sort of priesthood role. And they need an inheritance. An inheritance meaning a way to pay for and care for themselves without having to have the secular work. And trust me when I tell you, secular work is easier. It's less hours. You don't take it home with you quite like you do with this. Your day's over, you go home. It's much easier. I've done secular work. Okay? And so just a reminder, that's why he talks about it so much in the chapter. Right? He starts off right away. He says, the priests, the Levites, all the tribe of Levi have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They are to eat the offerings of Yahweh made by fire and his inheritance. So in other words, they get what you give to Yahweh. We've talked about that many times, right? All right, let's see. Okay, verse 5. It literally says, For Yahweh your only has chosen him, the Levite, out of all the tribes to stand and serve in the name of Yahweh, him and his sons forever. It's talking about the Kohen, the priest. Isn't that what I just said? You're going to be giving your tithes and your offerings to provide inheritance to the one who stands to serve before Yahweh. Why was Melchizedek given tithes from Abram? Because he was priest of the Most High. He was not a Levite. Levi hadn't been born yet. Okay? Jacob hadn't been born yet. So, you know, actually Isaac hadn't been born yet, I don't think, at this point. He's still Abram. <laughs> so certainly wasn't a Levitical priest, but he was standing to serve before Yahweh. All right, let's see. By the way, we talked about with the judges and the arrogance. You do that with the word too sometimes. If the word tells you A and you have an issue with it, are you being arrogant? It says what it says. And if the anointed teacher explains it to you so that you really can't argue with it, it is what it is, what you do with it then is either going to be submission or arrogance. Really, two basic simple choices. It's either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. If you do it, it's submission. If you don't do it, it's arrogance. All right. Let's see, where am I? Verse 9. Okay, in verse 9 he says... When you come into the land which Yahweh Elohim is giving you, do not learn to do according to the abomination of those Gentiles. Don't do what they do. Now, when he's talking about an abomination, he means the way they worship their Elohim, the things that they're doing that break Torah, don't do what they do. Do you realize that's how we ended up with Christmas? Is doing what they do. That's how we ended up with Easter? It's because we're doing what they do. Sunday worship? We're doing what they do. Fall festivals, Halloween, we're doing what they do. He says, don't do that. Let's see, verses 10 and 11, don't make your children pass through the fire or practice witchcraft. Okay, let's keep them away from that. I'm not going to get into detail with that. Verse 13, be perfect before Yahweh your Elohim. The word there is tamim. Okay, actually, that's literally what the word is there, tamim. In Hebrew, this means to be complete, whole, or blameless, filled with integrity. He says, be complete. Hmm. I came up with a new inspired thought writing this teaching today. In the context, you know, that's the thing I, he gave me as like my main thing to give you guys all the time is context, right? He just said the... Um, when you come into the land, don't do what they do. Don't put your children through the fire. Don't do magic and divination. Don't conjure spells or do these things with mediums and spiritists who call up the dead. For whoever does these things are an abomination to Yahweh, verse 12. And then he says, be perfect. Be complete. What do people go to mediums and spiritists and magicians, etc., for? Do they go there because they're complete? Or do they feel like there's something missing? And they're looking for answers. They're looking for stuff to fill in the gaps. He says, no, you be complete. 
knowing that Yahweh provides all that, you don't need to go anywhere else. Interesting? As a sort of different way to look at it. In the context, he says, I just told you not to do these things because I want you to be perfect or complete, whole. People don't go to those other people if they don't feel, if they, unless, they, unless they don't feel whole. Isn't that true? You go to the card readers and this thing, because you, you want answers, you feel incomplete, you feel like you're not whole, you feel like something's missing, and you're reaching and grasping at straws trying to find it. He says, not you, you be complete. I am, I'm, a, I'm sufficient to you. My will is sufficient to you. My, everything I do is sufficient for you. So look at it that way. Because again, it's not just be perfect in the middle of nowhere. He just said be perfect right after this other stuff he just said. Be complete. Be full. Be whole. Have integrity. Don't do these things that show a lack of integrity. For these nations whom you are possessing, do listen to those using magic, etc. But as for you, Yahweh has not appointed such for you. Interesting. Okay. Let's see, verses 15 through 19. So this is where we get into prophecy about Yeshua, for sure. But a whole lot more than just that. More, not bigger, but more broadly covering. Yahweh Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst. This is Moshe speaking, right? So a prophet like Moshe from your brothers, listen to him. A prophet from your brothers, not from the Gentiles, not from the Goyim, from your brothers. Whatever that means, the 12 tribes. And he says, listen to him. So this is going to be a prophet like me. That means it's going to be someone who speaks with authority like Moses did. With the humility that Moses had. Possibly the temperament that Moses had. A prophet like me, from your brothers. He says, listen to him. He's talking about Joshua and every other anointed, appointed between that and Messiah. He's not just talking about Messiah. Ultimately, he's talking about Messiah. But he's not talking about, hey, a few thousand years from now. No, he's saying, like, I'm about to make Joshua next in command. And when I do, listen to him. Now we raised him up. He's like me. He's going to take you the next step. All right? He says, oh, let's see. Um, listen to him. According to all you ask, Yahweh, your Elohim, and Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And Yahweh said, to me, what uh, they have spoken is good. I shall raise up for them a prophet. In other words, don't fall into this trap thinking, well, we're in the New Testament now, so the Ruach just teaches us. From that moment forward, Yahweh has decided, I'm going to speak to them through prophets. People who I will give authority to speak my word with authority. I will inspire them and strengthen them to speak my word with authority. He says, this goes back to Mount Sinai when you said, oh, I can't handle the sounds of your, the voice anymore. Please, Moses, you, you talk to him and tell us what he says. We don't want to hear from him directly. And you're thinking, oh, but I want to hear from him directly. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. You've never done that, so you don't know. Oh, I've heard the Father's voice. Maybe. Not like they did. Why would Yahweh ask questions like, what other nation has heard the voice of Yahweh and lived? Well, that means that you could hear it and die. And the people did think they were going to die. So he says, you asked for this. And Yahweh said to me, what they've asked, spoken is, by good he means it's approved. Let's not say it's good like it's a good thing. He's saying, I'll do it. I approve of it. Okay. I'll agree to it. So don't say that it was good. No, he wanted to talk to them directly. But he realized that people weren't ready. He said, so what they say, I, I, I'm okay with that. 
Okay? Now, he says, I shall raise up for them a prophet like you out of the midst of their brothers, and I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it, this is not only talking about Yeshua. It's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Malachi, Joshua, all of them. Okay, it's Nathan, it's Samuel, all the prophets, and the anointed leaders until they started with the kings, with Shaul. He's like, I'm going to raise him up out of your brothers and put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them all that I command him to speak. It shall be that the man who does not listen to my words, this goes back to chapter 17, same thing, right? In this case, though, it's not just when you have a question. This man's going to be in charge, and he's going to be giving guidance and leadership to, to help them and lead them into the kingdom, or in this case, the land. Remember, Joshua was going to take them across the Jordan. And it shall be that the man who does not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name, I'm going to require it of him. You know, we're, it's funny this how this works out, because this week on Saturday when we do the teaching, we are going to get to Ephesians chapter 4. How perfect that it matches right up with this. And he says, look, if you don't listen, I'm going to require it of you. That's big. He says, but the prophet, now he's going to say, but be careful, there will be people that claim to be mine who aren't. So first, let's take the seriousness. I am going to raise up a prophet. And I'm, it didn't say prophets, like 50,000 of them. As needed, one per group or whatever, right? Because he refers to them very much in the singular. I'm going to raise him up. I'm going to put my words in his mouth. He's going to speak on my behalf like Moshe. One man, three million people. Right? He says, however... There may be a prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name which I hadn't spoken, which I had not commanded him to speak, or to speak in the name of other mighty ones, even that prophet shall die. And so you say in your heart, well, how do we know who's who? It's a good question. How do we know when, you know, he, the word which Yahweh, that he says the word that Yahweh hadn't spoken? Well, when the prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh and the word doesn't happen or it doesn't come to be. That is the word that Yahweh had not spoken. That prophet has spoken it presumptuously and do not be afraid of him. By afraid, it means don't awe and reverence him. Right? Like fear of Yahweh. Don't show that person awe and reverence. Which means that every one of these brilliantly self-touting whatevers out there that have named dates over and over again that don't happen, stop giving them your awe and reverence. I don't know how else to be stronger about that. I know if they're out there listening, which I'm sure they're not, but that they'd be mad at me. Well, then they need to stop it. Okay? You know, any of you remember the movie, Oh God, with George Burns? Some of you are not old enough for that. Well, it was an old movie, quite humorous. John Denver, George Burns. And there was a big charismatic televangelist in that show and he asked the John Denver character, because George Burns was God, he said, well, what does God have to say to me? And he said, tell him, I said, please shut up. And the guy was like, oh, you, you're a false whatever you are. God would never tell me. He says, please, tell him, please shut up. So I'm going to say it to all you guys out there too. You're naming dates and touting he's coming next month and blah, 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 and all these things, that, and then it doesn't happen. Please shut up. Stop embarrassing Yahweh. Stop distracting the people, leading them astray, just so you can sell books and CDs and DVDs. Okay, please, stop. All right? Don't do that. And these are people that have been doing it, I know them long enough, that years, and yet they're still there. And everybody still listens. Not everybody, but enough. And some of you probably still listen to these people. I'm like, I don't get it. What do they have to do for you to realize they said Yahweh's, that something is happening and it doesn't come to be? It says, how do you know? He says, when the prophet speaks and the word is not. 
Now, don't tell me, oh, but at the end of it he said, not that I'm naming dates. Okay, go listen to the in focus called the Spiritual Diet Coke. Okay, that's where you go and eat a double cheeseburger and a large fries and get a Diet Coke because that's going to fix the calories you just had. Okay, saying at the very end of something you just made the strongest case you could that he's coming next month. Oh, by, by the way, I'm not naming dates just to cover yourself. That's like a spiritual Diet Coke. It fixes nothing. And nobody paid any attention to that little Diet Coke at the end. They listened to you and believed you and made life decisions because they thought he was coming. You go back to the 1700s, the Adventists had all of that problem. Every group has had that problem over the centuries. He, naming dates and he's coming. Every year. Seems like most years, the September prophecy. September whatever, he's coming. I actually did a teaching with somebody one time saying why we can believe he's not coming in September 23rd, whatever it was, a couple years ago. And guess what? He didn't come on that day. Right? He didn't come. But you're going to say, but I like him. Seriously? That's your answer? Yahweh says, do not reverence awe. Do not. This is a false prophet, he says. You're going to say, but I like him? That's your answer? Oh, but you don't know how important he was in my journey. Good. You already passed that part of your journey. You don't need that anymore. Yeah, he was an important part. You don't need him anymore. Do you know, I probably got a lot out of my fifth grade teacher. I don't need her anymore. I think it was a her. I can't remember that far back. I don't, I don't ever think I might need my sixth grade or fifth grade or third grade. But they were important then. All right, so these people were helpful up to a point in your journey. And then you realized they're saying things they shouldn't say. So good, move on. Okay, don't stone them and throw them around and do all this other stuff and rip them apart on Facebook. Just stop listening to them. I don't know how else to put that. It's what he says. He says, I'm comparing two things. The one who I pick, you need to listen to him. The other one, you do not listen to. And what do you do? Like a typical stiff-necked uh, Israelite, you do the opposite. You don't listen to him, but you listen to the guy who says what you, who tickles your ear and gets you all excited that your shoe is coming next month. It's not coming next month. There are guys out there still saying that, though. Because after all, this year, according to them, is a Shemitah year. And if he doesn't come this year, then we have to wait another seven years. So after all, then he has to come this year. No, he doesn't have to come this year. Just because it fits your model. All right. Sorry, I, it just, I'm a little passionate about this stuff. I can't help myself, as I say in that often enough. Okay. Then we get to, let's see, where are we up to? Go to chapter 20, we'll skip 19. I don't know why I didn't have a whole lot there. It had to do with dealing with some specific things that came up. Okay, there's different cities, etc. what you deal with. Let's go to chapter 20 and verse 1. When you go out to battle against your enemies and shall see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid. For Yahweh your Elohim who brought you up from the land of Egypt is with you. This is a key verse in the teaching fear of Yahweh. So what's it saying? It's saying when you look out and you see overwhelming odds. Over, I mean, you just are overwhelmed. Like, there's no way I can handle this. I'm going to get destroyed here. I can't win. He says, you're looking at things wrong. This is the same one that brought you out of your Egypt. All of you were brought out of an Egypt. All of, you, all of you were slaves to something. All of you were Ephesians 2, dead in your trespasses. He says, don't be afraid. Go listen to the fear of Yahweh teaching. It'll help you with that verse. All right? Okay, verse 2 through 4, when you go to battle, Yahweh fights for you to deliver you from your enemies. If you're in right relationship with him. 
If, it's, if you wonder why it's not working, it's because maybe you're not in right relationship with him. Because it doesn't work that way, right? Okay. Verses 5 through 9. In setting up a command to do battle, first weed out the otherwise committed and the weak ones among you. That's really, I'm paraphrasing here for verses 5 through 9, right? It says, you know, ask who is the man who has built a house and hasn't dedicated it. Let him go return to the house. And when a man has planted a vineyard and not begun to use it, blah, blah, blah. When a man is engaged to a woman and not taken her. When a man is afraid of tender heart. Okay. So basically, they're going to war here. They're going to be fighting as they cross the Jordan. He says, look. You officers, you need to first weed out the otherwise committed and weak. They're not ready to go to war. Yeshua basically said the same thing when he said, follow me, I'm going to war. And the guy says, oh, but you know, I have to bury my father and I've got to go do this and I've got to go do that. By the way, his father wasn't dead. Okay, nobody in that society would have left the dead body Okay, if you've been in a Jewish community and I don't know anybody who's Jewish, we put them in the ground as fast as is possible. I'm not saying that's a joke. I'm saying, like, as soon as it's possible, we put them in the earth. We only wait, if necessary, for somebody to travel to get there or something like that. Otherwise, we put them in the ground right away. All right? Not because it's a convenient day. If they die on a Monday, we put them in the ground Tuesday or Wednesday. As fast as it can happen. So this person didn't say to Yeshua, my father died, and I got to go bury him. No. He's saying, my father's old, and I got to take care of him, and then when he dies, and this, and then, I'll, then I can come follow you. He says, then you're not ready. He says, you can't put your hand to the plow and look backward. You can't have other commitments. You can't be weak. So he's telling the officers here, we're going to war. And yeah, Yahweh's, and by the way, we just said that Yahweh's going to fight the battles for you, but we're going to war. I can't have you be freaking out and panicking and doing whatever. And being all distracted by, oh, oh but I, I got a vineyard and I, got, I just got married and I just got, you know. Now, the people who are otherwise committed doesn't mean they can't get involved at some point. But, you know, especially with the married ones, he later says, you are not to obligate them for anything for at least one year. And we'll get to that probably here in a minute. All right. Let's see. Oh, by the way, when we did the false prophet thing at the end of chapter 18, that matches up with chapter 13, but in the opposite, right? Chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, we did that last week. It had to do with what? If they say something will happen, and it does, but it's being used to lead you astray, here it's saying he says it happens and it doesn't. So it covers both possible scenarios, right? All right, let's see. Verses 18 and 19 explains what putting under the ban is. Okay, so in 18 it says, um, let's see, where are we up to? Chapter 20. Have I got the right verses here? No. Let me see if I can find the right verses here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it'll be 17 and 18, okay? I put it as 18 and 19. All right, so here it says, verse 16, it said, only the cities of the peoples which Yahweh gives you as an inheritance, you do not keep alive any of them breathe, but you shall certainly put them under the ban. And then it lists all these people, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations and, the, and sin against Yahweh, okay? So this is telling you, look, putting under the ban is to you don't leave them alive or any of them there to breathe. Putting under the ban means to utterly destroy. Okay, because sometimes people wonder, what's that phrase, putting under the ban? All right. I need to make a note. I have the wrong verses here. So it really should be 16, like through 18. My pen is in writing. That's not helping me. There we go. All right. It's only 8.30. We're doing good. I'm almost done. Actually, that was it. Not I'm at the end of chapter 20. All right, awesome. So, any comments or questions? Hopefully they make sense. Look, Yahweh is giving them, through Moshe, a very adamant speech, sermon, message, instruction, guidance, something 
before they go across this water into the land. I mean, this is Moses' final moment to try to make some impression on these hard-headed people. Okay? So he is not playing games. He's not mincing words. He's just like, guys, listen up. Fear him. Don't fear them. Do what he says. Don't do what they do. Guard, keep. Don't be weak. Be complete. Don't look for other sources. You need help. There's help. But do what they tell you. There's a lot going on here. All right, if anybody has a comment or question, you can line up, and then we have the live stream. Did that help? Was that any good? And I do apologize for not being more passionate about this subject. We're going to change mics, okay. Why? Okay. All right, apparently we need to do a battery change. Okay, so. So uh, who's, don't you still need one over there? You have one for that? Okay. All right, Janet's gonna come up and get us started. Look, all I can tell you is, if I'm in a role, like it says, one leg onto Moses, all I could ask you is, please listen to what he says. Don't listen to what I say, but what he says. You gotta look for those guys. Those guys exist. That's what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 4. When he mentions prophets, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and shepherds. And he says, these guys are here for your benefit. All right? Janet? Rabbi, thank you. My question is on chapter 18, 11. Uh, when it talks about one who calls up the dead. So sometimes I, like that happened today. Somebody was talking about, it's an old woman and she hears things in the place where she lives. And so she started talking about that. I didn't really put too much attention to it. But my question is, listening to that is as bad as being part of it, even though you're no, not really... Okay, no, good. Okay. no. All right, let me, let me say this for those of you out there that may wonder. I do believe that there's a spirit world. Okay, I do. I don't understand it. I know there are those that I've interacted with and counseled who have had a much more intimate in, interaction with that world. And I believe them when they tell me the things that they've had experience with. And what I've not been able to understand is the appearing randomness of who seems to be affected and, and picked on. And I, I can't connect, because people always kind of want to understand, well, why are they bothering me? And I, I can't see a pattern there. So don't read too much in if you are experiencing something that somehow you did something wrong or some other thing. I don't. There's no consistency when I ask the question. I've run into enough of people like this, not a huge amount, but enough of them that I, I look for always patterns. And I can't seem to find one there. I've got people that have lived in a house and they're hearing stuff going on in the house and they move and they hear stuff again in the next house. And it seems to be going wherever they go. They seem reasonably, you know, normal people as far as like not just making stuff up or hallucinating. And yet... And I hear this kind of thing, you know, over and over again, you know, here and there, and there doesn't seem to be a consistent pattern to go, well, this is what's going on. If you stop doing this, it should go away. I also, you know, I wish that I could give you more than that because I know that people do come with me saying, this is really, you know, um, exhausting emotionally and spiritually trying to deal with it all the time. I mean, it's, it's really hard on the people that are going through these things. And so I just want you to know that I don't talk much about it because, I, again, I only want to give you words that I'm confident in, that are his words, and he has not explained that world to me at this point. Just throwing it out there, okay? If you have that issue and you want to talk to me about it, I've had a lot of success helping people get through it and even get disconnected from it. But not because I understand it, just because he gives me authority to try to do those things so I can try to help. But 
I wasn't able to help everybody, and I don't understand really what's going on, okay? So just so you know, in case people all of a sudden the phone's going to ring off the hook. Well, Rabbi said, this is not Ghostbusters, okay? <laughs> Who are you going to call? Rabbi and Elder Billy. Okay, you know. So I just wanted to let you know, I don't, I wish I did, but I don't have a lot of good answers for that realm of things, okay? I think sometimes we attribute mental health issues as if they're demons. That doesn't mean there aren't demons. It just means that they didn't always in the ancient world know what to do with mental health stuff and what, how to describe it. On the one hand, that could be a way to ignore the reality of the demon world and the, of the spiritual world. On the other hand, I think we ascribe way too much to it that doesn't actually belong there. It can, it can be either one. It can be out of balance either way. So what they're really doing doesn't get actually mentioned right, and what they're not doing is credited to them and all this kind of stuff. And so maybe one day he'll give me better insight so I can give you better answers. All right, Michael. Shalom, Rabbi. Shalom. I remember being here last year for the same exact Parsha, and I'm getting so much more out of it this year than I did last year. Um, but So I wanted to thank you. But I also wanted to see if, see if my thinking is actually correct on this because I'm almost 100% certain that I'm positive, but maybe you can guide it or add a little bit of nuance to it, is that um, when it's talking about in 17, I believe, yes, and let all the people hear, fear, and no longer do arrogantly. So if, the, if Yeshua is our judge in the end of days, then we're going to be judged by his commands, his guidance as a judge, that was given in the Torah and again um, expounded upon within the, the many teachings and many parables that he gave in the Gospels. And I just wanted to know, um, is, that, is that accurate? Do you have any nuance to add to that? Is there anything? Is what accurate? Say that part that, of it. That, that he, being the judge um, in the end of days, that, that we would most definitely be acting arrogantly if we go against the Torah and against the, uh, the additional, um, I guess, expounding upon the Torah that he gave during his teachings in the, uh, in the Gospels there. Absolutely. Look, there are, there are phrases that we use to describe people that have, for lack of a better way, I guess, lots of different potential nuances or, that's not even the word I want, it can manifest or look very different in different, you know, it can manifest differently. What I mean by that is, normally when you hear the word arrogant, you picture some really cocky, strutty person running around all full of themselves. And he's saying, no. Arrogance also is when you choose you over him, when you choose not to submit and listen to the authority. So we have to be careful that we don't just knee-jerk, hear the word arrogance, and go, well, I'm not arrogant, I'm very humble, and so that word can't be applying to me. Well, it still could if you're doing this. All right? I'll give you another word that comes up all the time in my conversation with people. I may call somebody or tell somebody that they're being selfish. They also may be among the most generous people I know. But selfish doesn't mean you're not generous in one of the different ways it can manifest. It just means that it's all about you. It's about self, self-ish. So it doesn't, so I can find somebody that gives to everyone, is giving and always, they're generous, right? And I say, I said, you, you know, your problem is you're selfish. The person's like, oh, they get all offended. I said, no, it's because you need everything to be the way you need it to be. Call it self-centered. See, but if I say self-centered, you're thinking arrogant again. Someone who's just strutting around, it's all about me. No. But when you need the world to be your way and everything to be your way, that could be selfish in a form you're not thinking about. Because you think, but I'm very generous. I give the shirt off my back. I give away all these things. I'm always buying stuff for people and giving things to people and doing things for people. Yes, I'm sure that's true. But then when you're having meltdowns because everything isn't the way you want it to be or think it should be, etc., that's again, still having the same problem. So think of the same thing with arrogance. Don't just lock arrogance into, you know, thinking of like in the movies, some really good looking, you know, woman or man star and they're just strutting around like the you know what doesn't smell and that kind of, right? They're just, oh, uh. yes, that is arrogance in a very easy to identify form. 
But it's arrogance also to not submit because then you're increasing your sovereignty and elevating it higher than it belongs, right? So I just want us to be careful with words. That's like I'd say this every time the word lust comes up. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I was experienced in my life that whenever I heard the word lust, I'm thinking sexual, you know, you know desires. You can lust for power. You can lust for food. You can lust for lots of things, right? So lusting is simply a strong craving or desire for something. But when as soon as you hear the word lust, you think, well, I don't have any sexual cravings like that, so it must not be talking about me. So when it says when you give in to the lust of the flesh, well, that's the cravings that the flesh wants, and it doesn't mean that you want flesh. Maybe you want fame and fortune or power or something, right? Whatever it is that you're craving, that's fleshly. It's about you. It's not about the above, right? So let's just be aware that just because you see a negative label, first ask the question, am I looking at it fully because maybe it applies to me, but not the way I would normally think? Does that make sense? Give the opportunity, because Yahweh didn't say it here just for the five people you think would fitting into the picture. He said it because we could all fall into this picture. Okay, we all could have lusts of the flesh. Even if it's not lusting for flesh. But a lot of us just hear that. We can all have arrogance by not listening to when he's telling us to do stuff. Which is what Michael was asking about. Well, when Yeshua shows up, are we going to have this problem? Some people will. Because they're not going to want to do what he said. They're going to want to do what they want to do. Look, when you listen to whoever you listen to, that's your choice. If you choose to listen to him, that's very good submission. If you choose to listen to anybody else, it's arrogance. That's you choosing what you prefer. Because now you didn't do what he said because you chose something you liked better. You liked better. It's arrogance. All right, Steve. Shamash Steve. Okay. Um, in 1619, it says, Do not distort right ruling. Do not show partiality. Take a bribe. For a bribe blind. Is that applying to the judges or yes. as we operate as well? Well, I mean, it's applying to those when you're in a position to make judgment. So it's saying is when they come to you, when we're leading it to 17, to make, um, to give right rulings, when people are asking you questions, you are to not be influenced by any of those types of things that would distort your judgment because of some benefit to you, which is what I was saying, you know, in my notes, right? So a bribe would be a benefit to me, and because it benefits me, I might benefit you. And I don't want to benefit you unless you are appropriately supposed to benefit. And I don't want anything to keep me from chastising, if chastisement is correct. The judgment has to be the judgment clean and uninfluenced by gain. Okay? Michael? Here in chapter 20, when we're... um when it's talking about we're, we're getting ready to go do battle, um, one of the, two of the things actually, two of the things that I had going on here were, in my mind anyway, is that um, if the man has a house, hasn't dedicated it, has a vineyard, hasn't used it, or has a, or is engaged to be married and has not taken his bride yet, he doesn't really, he, he might not have as much to fight for as those he's fighting around, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, that's what I said. The, those that were otherwise distracted. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll, um, in addition to that, the um, those nations that we're going to fight against, like I guess, in you know, kind of a modern sense, really, are our employers, and you know, sometimes our spouse, or sometimes our children, or sometimes our parents, or you know, sometimes our best friends, uh, you know, and um, I guess you know, like we're not fighting obviously with you know breastplates and helmets and swords and stuff, but, you know, we have to have a, a, an internal breastplate on to protect our heart for him, an internal helmet on to protect our minds, keep our minds clean for him, and sometimes a sword to cut the ties. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Chris. Okay. Uh, I want to see if this addition to what you were talking about in Deuteronomy 18 would be appropriate. So you were talking about how 
uh, verse 13 of chapter 18 was not like in isolation, but you have the verses before it about uh, witchcraft and things as far as uh, finding people who are uh, supposed to solve your problems but are not really uh, going to solve the emptiness. And so if you keep going and talk about, so be perfect before Yahweh, your Elohim, for these nations um, you're possessing uh, do listen to the, those using magic and to diviners, but as for you, Yahweh your Elohim has not appointed such for you. And then if you keep going, it says Yahweh your Elohim has, shall raise up for you a prophet. And so um, if you continue the idea of being perfect, you could connect that to Ephesians 4 when it talks about the fivefold ministry with the idea of perfecting um, instead of be, leaving empty. Amen. Okay. And... I had a question about chapter 19 and verse 9. So it says to love Yahweh your Elohim um, and to walk in all his way, or well, walk in his ways. Um, and in Deuteronomy 10, 12, that's flipped. It's uh, walk, on a whole, walk in all his ways and then love Yahweh. So I'm wondering if there's any meaning to that uh, because you've taught before how there's a, a sequence where you go from fearing Yahweh and then to walk in all his ways and then you love him. And if there's a, like, a meaning why that's different here? All right. Because once you've accomplished the initial setup of Deuteronomy 10, 12, then you get to, like when Yeshua says, if you love me, guard the commands. Okay? So this is more on the point of, he says, fear me, walk in all my ways, love me, serve me, guard my commands. So it's still love, guard the commands in that order, right? Love, serve, guard the commands. And so, but he's talking to a people now that are already in covenant, that have developed a relationship for over 40 years. And so we're now looking at, if you love me, guard my commands. If you, you're not going to love me if you already haven't done fear me and walk in all my ways. And by walking all my ways, it doesn't mean that you guarded them, that you've done them enough to realize I love you and gave you my ways. Okay? So it's, it's, it's not really skipping anything or rearranging it. It's just a different point in time hitting the highlights of where we are at that point, which is love me, guard the commands. Okay? Because we're really going to walk in his ways. He says it twice. He says, fear me, walk in my ways. In other words, fear me, do what I say. Then he says, love me, do what I say. Guard my commands. But he wants you to go from walking in them to guarding them. Walking in them means you're trying them out. You're doing it. You're walking it out. Guarding them means you're actually diligently paying attention to them and protecting them. Okay? Did that help? All right, good. Good points. All right, live stream. Question from Shelley Bell Creations. Can you please ask Rabbi if, we, if he will make his notes available on the website like his other notes, please? And thank you. All right. I don't, think lo I don't think any notes have been provided on the website for years. So, so uh, you know, and that was just a look. All I did in my notes, there's nothing in my notes. I just took pieces of the verse and put them separated in my notes. There's no notes. It's like I, looked, I took the verse and I broke it into bullet points. Like verses 8 through 13, I broke that into bullet points when it talks about when there arises a matter too hard for you. All right, it matters too hard, go to the one who stands, declare the right rulings, guard and do according to what they say. I mean, I just broke it up. There's no notes here. It's just parts of the verses that I wanted to talk about. So I appreciate that you want them, Shelly Bell, but there really isn't notes. Okay? Everything I said is right there in the verse. Well, everything in my notes is right in the verse. Everything I said is whatever I said. All right. Next. From Robert Brackett. Rabbi, to put under the ban an application today would be cutting off anything that tries to draw you away from Abba. Am I applying this right? No. I mean, yes and no. I mean, look, there's no putting under the ban now. Okay, putting under the ban was something Yahweh said to do when they went into the ites, okay? And utterly destroying that kind of thing. You can apply it in your life to say those things that, that draw you away from Abba, you need to get rid of them and destroy them, etc. There are other verses that talk about that. But... They don't use the phrase put under the ban. Putting under the ban is something very specific in terms of when there was a conflict between nations and Yahweh said that particular nation is to be put under the ban. 
So that's, a, a, you know, as far as today, could you apply it in some way? Yes. Utterly destroy out of your life those things that are abominations to him. But you got to be careful. You don't want, you know, we don't have the, we're not killing anybody. You know, do you want to take the stuff like you're, like if you have a bunch of Christmas stuff, sure, take it outside, destroy it. Put it under the band, just utterly destroy it. Okay? That's, I mean, there are things that you can apply that way, but it's just the wrong phrase. So my answer is yes, you need to apply this in the way you're describing, but no, I don't know that the phrase is the right phrase. It's a very specific phrase. All right, next. From Chaos, Rabbi, please expound on Debarim 19, verses 20 and 21. Oh, you know what? I think that was actually in my notes. How did I skip that? Well, you know what? It didn't end up in my notes somehow. All right, because I normally do cover that. Okay, so 19, it says, Let let the rest hear and fear and never again do the evil matter in your midst and let your eye not pardon. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And I think actually this comes up again in next week's Torah portion, which is where I actually have it um, in my notes or somehow it ended up in the wrong place. So what is it talking about there? It's simply saying is equal and appropriate, you know, measure. Okay? Eye for eye means if, you, if something is, like, okay, you break something of mine that's worth $10. Okay, then you should, your penalty should be equivalent to something like $10 or replacing it. You're not going to get a $1,000 punishment for a $10 crime. Okay? So when he says eye for eye, tooth for tooth, there needs to be a, a balanced and rational and reasonable and logical connection between the crime and the punishment. Okay? It's, it's just a metaphor or a, an idiomatic phrase for that. Okay? All right. You stole my goat. You owe me a goat. That would be an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth or a goat for a goat. All right? You burn down my house? Well, then you got to build me a house. Okay? You steal my goat, you don't have to build me a house. That would not be eye for an eye. Okay? Next. From Shamash Gary, chapter 17, verse 12. Interesting that it says the man who acts arrogantly. I feel men struggle with this more as we are taught that we don't need anyone. Men need men, especially in regards to the law of 33%. All right. I guess I have to explain that to everybody. How many of you know what the law of 33% is? Oh, good. A few of you do. All right. Good. All right. So, I know Gary, and Gary, like some of the other men in this group, are in an appropriate way sort of obsessed with us figuring out how to properly be men, okay, and interact with other men to learn how to be what Dawi meant when he created men. And the law of 33% basically has to do with the idea that you spend a third of your time with those at your level, a third of your time with those below your level, a third of your time with those above your level. Okay? And so this idea that men struggle with this more as we are taught that we don't need anyone anymore, then they're not going to realize they need that 33% with those that are higher up to help pull them and draw them up. Okay? Men tend to look for people that are at least peers, and if they want to feel elevated, they look for those below so they can feel better, but they don't look for those that are above to draw them and pull them up, okay? So from a benevolent point of view, you need to be the above for somebody. That's the 33% below you, and you're helping draw them up. You need those that are exactly where you are that you can commiserate and be on the same level and fight the same fight, and then you need to go find the 33% above you that can help teach you how to go higher. All right? It's a powerful, you know, personal development tool, just to, or at least concept. Okay? Most people spend almost all of their 50-50 or whatever they want to split it on their level and below. Okay? You're not going to usually find, you know, Ten men that all make $40,000 a year 
and one that makes $140,000 a year in the same group. They all tend to group together in their level or below. So if you want to elevate, then you've got to spend time with people that are at the next level, at least a third of your time, and see how they do things differently and learn what works, okay? I mean, it's, it's a very simple concept. All right, I could, let me, <laughs> this is going to sound like maybe a foolish analogy. Believe it or not, every now and then, I'll play a video game. All right, I'll play a video game. Now, if I go to play a video game, and I play, let's say, with Chris, and with Brian, and with Michael, and with Elder Billy, and none of us have played this game before, then we're all struggling at the same level. And if I spend all my time right there, we're all going to kind of progress or not progress at whatever level we do. But what if I spend a third of my time watching some videos of a guy who's like way awesome at the game, who's been playing it for years? Then all of a sudden now I have ideas, concepts, insights for that next level of life or the game, right? And I can now explode past wherever those guys are. Now, I can share that with them and we all move up, right? Because now, at that point, I've moved up. There's still people above me, and now they're below me. So I would like to bring them up to me as we're all trying to keep going up. Because I do that every time I play a game. First thing I do is try to find somebody somewhere that already plays the game well so I can learn how not to waste my time and go fast. Because I, I, I'm too impatient to just play the game without trying to do it fast. I want to progress quickly, whatever game it is, Right? And the way it is nowadays, just like in life, there are people out there, no matter what it is you're doing in life, that are posting all over the internet, if they're in your level or above, if they're above your level, that you can find in whatever area of life you're doing. You're doing business. You're doing uh, entrepreneurial stuff. You're doing, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're doing home improvement stuff just in your house. There's people out there that will teach you the fast way, the right way, the efficient way, the little hacks that work, or whatever. But you got to spend time with those who are above. Further along, let's call it. Not above like in the above, but further along the path than you are. They've learned a few things. Okay? You know, used to be. <laughs> used to be. Sadly, it's not true anymore. Used to be that the older in the community, the elders of the community, were the wise because they'd already lived the life, done the things. Accomplished all that had to be accomplished, and you would glean so much from them. Not the case when your elders or the guys who all they did all their whole life was stay at that same mediocre junk existence their whole life, and you're going to learn nothing from them. Think about it. And so, we're, so that's why our children don't give honor to elders. The elders have nothing to give them. Because they look at the elders going, sure, you're broke, you're unhealthy, you got nothing. What am I going to learn from you? How to be broke, unhealthy, and have nothing? I'm not trying to be cruel here. But what if you have some success? A child might say, you know what? I might want to listen to that guy or that woman because they have something I'd like to have when I get to where they are. We've got tons of examples of people that are broke and unhealthy and have nothing. And they're in their 60s and 70s and 80s. Most people retire broke. So we don't have elders to honor who've learned something. They got nothing to share. So if you want to leave something as a legacy, have something to share. Accomplish something that you can then pass down. And then people can spend time with you as their upper 33%. And they could be your lower 33% so that you can actually have that experience. Okay? All right. We're getting close here to the end. Anybody else? What do you got? Grayson was just sitting there taking it all in. He was got totally distracted. Uh, from Ashley Condon. Question regarding the witness who throws the first stone. What should I do if a witness throws the first stone falsely against me? How do I hit 
hard enough to follow Romans 12, verse 19. All right. First of all, the witness throwing the stone has nothing to do with what you're talking about. And then we go to Romans and see what's going on here. Give me one second. Romans 12, 19. Okay, 12.19 says, Beloved, do not revenge yourselves, but give place to the wrath, for it has been written, vengeance is mine. Okay, you pay attention to Romans 12. There isn't anything that says that that person can throw the first stone at you just because they claim to be a witness. This is in a court of law. So unless that witness, Ashley, was in a court of law, which our laws do not allow anybody to throw stones at you. The law might throw some stones at you. But there's, no, there's nothing in our law that says that a witness gets to do anything to you. So you're talking about someone who claims to be a witness or something starts throwing stuff at you. Use Romans 12, 19. Comes to leadership and look for guidance. Okay, because that person is not doing Deuteronomy, throwing the first stone. They're just taking it upon themselves arrogantly to throw stones at you. Okay? Because they're standing in judgment and deciding that they know better. Okay? The throwing the stone, a judge has to tell them, go ahead and do that. All right? Because they have to search it out and prove that that witness is true. All right, next. I believe that is all the questions at this time. All right, amen. <laughs> all right, who opened? Who, who opened us today? Kendall did. Okay. So let's get um, Michael. All right, your hand went up first. Michael, come up here and close us. I had to pick the person sitting the furthest away from the mic, but that's okay. <laughs> Look, I hope everybody not... See, I always like to say it this way, and I'm going to change it. I was going to say, I hope you enjoyed the study. Actually, I don't. I hope you got something out of it that you will use, okay? I don't, I don't really care if you enjoyed it. Because enjoying it doesn't necessarily mean anything. I, know people, I got a lot of people telling me how much they enjoy my messages, and I know full well they're not doing it, what I'm saying. So I hope that you got something out of it and will use it and do it. Amen? All right, that was my closing prayer. <laughs> all right, Michael's going to go ahead and close us in prayer if you all want to rise. Avina Malkenu, our Father, our King, we thank you for your words, we thank you for your teaching, and we thank you for putting Rabbi and Elder and Rabbi Tom here to help lead and guide this ministry and guide this body into growing. And we, we just pray that we can take this teaching in that we've gotten tonight, make it part of our lives, and act upon it every minute of every day until you return. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. 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 All right. All right. So if you want to wave goodbye, we're going to talk to the people out there on the camera. You can come on this side of the room. Hey, little darling. All right. That's fine. Why are we laughing back there? He said we're going to trap him. They're going to get on either side of me here. All right. Everybody ready? Nope, we still got people moving. Get everybody shifted over here. All right, this is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. All right. So we want to let everybody out there know how much we do appreciate them by wishing them a Laila Tov, a good night, Shavua Tov, a good week, and we're going to tell them that we love them. Here we go, on three. One, two, three.